right, uh, future pathologist. Here we go. We are on um, Unit 1A. Um, this is the second week of class, and we are going to be discussing um, the cell as a unit of health and disease. So much of what we're talking, going to talk about today in this particular lecture is going to be review. Um, many of these things you have heard before. Um, uh, specifically, uh, if you were in my exercise biochemistry class, you will have remembered that um, the first lesson reviewed um, the genome and very important components of the cell. And uh, we kind of did a deep dive on some of that. Well, uh, the cell as a unit, um, both of function and uh, of, of functional health and disease, um, is the foundation of this course because uh, cells or a single cell can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Enemy. It could be the difference between uh, a healthy body, a healthy system, or a system that is experiencing uh, catastrophic failure. So um, this, the single unit, which is the cell, most of our derangements uh, or our alterations in physiology begin there. And then it can basically impact a series of cells and that can impact a tissue. And then the tissue that is um, experiencing dysfunction can impact an organ and then an organ, which is experiencing uh, dysregulation and dysfunction can impact another organ and um, dysregulate communication between the endocrine system. And all these things uh, could essentially begin to make this domino effect where the first domino falls and then everything else behind it uh, falls as well in unison. So we're going to talk about um, in this first lecture just some of the basic most important uh, cellular organelles, cellular the, the genome within the cell, the components of the genome, um, and we're not going to do a super big deep dive. Um, for the sake of this course, uh, we're not going to go very deep into the mechanistic things that cause these diseases. We're going to look at more of an overhead of what these diseases are and then kind of go beneath the surface a little bit and say, okay, well, this is how it starts and get to know a couple of the, the, the culprits or the players that are involved in these processes and then uh, kind of move on because as you'll see from this first lecture, there's a lot of material and um, we can't stay too long on any one thing um, because it, it will be uh, problematic for your study and in your, for your reading. Uh, any one of these slides that we're going to talk about, uh, many scientists have spent their entire career studying. So uh, we can do a very surface level exploration of this information, or uh, you guys can commit to a PhD and spend the remaining years of your life studying it more. And then there's a bunch of space in between. So we're going to kind of look at that space in between and focus more on introduction of certain things. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about what these things are. So if we're talking about receptors, if we're talking about endosomes, if we're talking about lysosomes, uh, exocytosis, and endocytosis, whatever it is, we're going to present it and we're going to discuss a little bit about what its function in is just so you get an understanding of what it does in the cell. Um, now, the reason I'm telling you this is because you, there's going to be projects where you guys have to kind of go out on your own and I'm going to get my wrench out and I'm going to loosen up the training wheels and I'm going to take those training wheels off. And you have to be able to say, okay, I, I have this article. I'm going to read this article on, let's say, um, G coupled protein receptors. And, um, I have to know when to say enough is enough. I've gone deep enough into this material because when I send you guys out on your own and you start to do this, this research on your own, and that's going to happen in uh, exam three and exam four, uh, you got to be able to know when to pump the brakes and say, okay, I, I covered enough of this. I know what it does. I can talk about how it functions with other things in the cell. And that's what this entire unit is about. And most of the course it's communication. It's how do these things, these biochemicals, uh, these these uh, uh, ions, these transporters, these proteins, these DNA molecules, uh, how do they work together in unison? 
And when we talk about how they work together in unison, we also got to keep in mind that there's hundreds of other proteins that are watching them and saying, okay, are these things behaving the right way? And those are called regulators or modulators. Um, so we have this like remarkable system in our body where we have a series of checks and balances to make sure that these chemicals all play nicely together. And, and if they don't, um, if one of them decides that they want to go rogue and stop playing nicely with others, right, when they want to take their ball and leave, well, that's going to impact the, the all the other properties in the cell that are depending on that. So um, that's why we're talking about health and disease. So this is when everything is working well, everything is regulated, everything is doing the job that it should be doing. And this is when one of those one of those properties say, you know what, I'm done, I'm taking my toys, I'm going home, you guys are on your own. And when that one component of the cell does that, then we start to have issues that leads to dysregulation or abnormalities or 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 disease and and that's the major takeaway from this um so what we're going to talk about today it's for the objectives is just we're going to talk about some of the pieces of the cell and specifically the genome um you know many 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 diseases start here at the genome so at the at the most basic level of dna uh when it comes to mutation and dna um this is a big source for the development of, of certain pathologies. We're going to talk about the plasma membrane. We're going to talk about uh, some of the major players uh, with the plasma membrane. Um, and we're going to talk about what they do in regulating cell communication, what they do in regulating cell function, and what they do in regulating cell health. And then when we lose um, some of those receptors, they, they decide to take their toys and go home, or they start to behave badly, right? They're naughty receptors. Um, they uh, they can cause complications in the cell, and it basically uh, will cause the the cell to do things that it's not programmed or regulated to do. Uh, we're going to talk about just a couple of organelles. I'm not going to destroy you guys with these organelles because again, we could spend I could spend three weeks just talking about this first chapter, right? So we got to kind of select. We got to be very selective of what we're talking about and what we're reading. And this is going to help you guys with your reading assignments because. I'm saying keep your focus to this, right? Um, don't kind of go beyond that. If I don't talk about it in the lecture, don't read about it. And what I'm really going to try to do, if time allows me to do so, is uh, I'm going to provide you guys with a sheet every week that tells you the page numbers and the sections to read in the textbook to be successful with uh, this program. And uh, time is something that I do not have much of right now, but I really want to help you guys help yourselves and uh, help well, basically all of us get through this together because this is going to be difficult content. So the best, the, you know, the if I can organize this in a way where it really kind of puts a spotlight on material and lets you guys really focus on what's important, I'm going to try to do that. Uh, we are going to talk about receptors and the processes, and I, I don't think that's spelled right. I probably had a like a little baby stroke when I was typing that, so I, I apologize for that. Um, cellular activation. Well, what is what is cellular activation? Well, that's when the outside world of the cell wants to communicate with the inside world of the cell, right? So we we have intracellular processes and we have extracellular processes, and a lot of times when we start to get signals from outside the cell. Um, those can be catalysts to start a series of uh, dysregulation within the cell that can lead to the development of a disease. And then we're going to talk about like the mitochondria and, and the role that mitochondria plays both in health and in apoptosis and necrosis, so with those, like cell death. Um, so those are the major components that we're going to talk about. I have about 30 something slides and there's only two really long-winded slides that I'll talk to you guys about and and I'll let, I'll let you guys know what those are when we get there um and they're mostly going to be about uh, the endo and exocyte exocytosis we're going to focus more on endocytosis because if I did focus a lot on exocytosis I would add another 10 to 15 slides to this so um in my opinion you guys are going to have your hands full with this first lecture anyways and there's no necessary there's no reason to give you unnecessary work just to give you volume right because what i would like to do is give you quality and then test you on that quality and get quality responses uh, from you so let's dig in here so our story begins and it begins with the regulation of communication um, we have these two young, oops, wrong button. Sorry. Let me go back. What is happening here? 
we have these uh, two lovely individuals here, and uh, we have a phone being shared between them, and then the line connecting to the uh, receivers of the phone, and there is a beautiful, well-received, well-articulated communication between these two lovely individuals. So what is to happen then, I ask you, if I were to take a pair of scissors and I were to cut that communicate that line right there in half, right? What would happen? Well, well, obviously these two people are side by side, so they could still hear each other. But let's let's have a suspension of disbelief for a moment and just pretend that they're several hundred miles away. Well, if we were to cut that line, we would no longer have communication. So one of the major components that allows these two people to co communicate clearly is this line, and this line connects. The message being sent from here and the, the message being received here. And the cell works a lot like that. It is going to use chemicals and receptors and regulators and messengers and secondary messengers and transcription factors to basically take information from outside the cell, some type of stimulus, and deliver that Im information to the inside of the cell. And most times, that information is going to travel down to the nucleus where the information is going to be processed and we are going to get a result uh, as uh, from that that message that was received by a receptor. So the story of communication um, in a very healthy system, let me kind of go back here and let me get this bigger. In a very healthy system, uh, whether we're talking about a cellular system or whether we're talking about a tissue or an organ or the whole body as a whole, we have a uh, very organized and well-regulated and well-constructed lines of communication. And you can see that in this picture here, right? So this picture, we have uh, the power lines, right? We have the power being sent. Uh, we have a, a, a antenna here that has cell towers. So in this picture, we have lots of lines of communication. We have various forms of communication. We have power. You can see antennas down here. Everything is functioning together to make sure that our cell phones work. We have power to the house. We have power to the phones. Um, and, and we can pick up any phone anywhere and make a call and that call will successfully be received. Uh, you can see here too, we have this very organized structure. It's kind of it's kind of sloppy, but I mean, let's look at these microprocessor chips here and, and this, these phone lines here and these internet lines. And you can see that, you know, we, at least we have some sort of organization. We have uh, various wires which are connected to the various points that they need to be in order to have communication function accurately. And then we have, uh, you know, fiber optic wires and different phone line wires that are also very organized in different colors. So we know that various colors do various things in this entire communication process. So this is nice and pretty and organized. And, and when we have things like this occurring, we have successful communication. Um, and when we have things doing what they should be doing in the cell, we have we have healthy cellular processes. We have a healthy system. We have a healthy tissue. We have a healthy organ. Um, and, uh, you know, things like diet, things like lifestyle, things like uh, behavioral risk factors, such as smoking, drinking, using chemical substances, uh, going to the tanning beds to make sure you're looking nice and crispy, like you're from SoCal when you're actually from NorCal. Uh, these things will scramble the messages being sent to the cell and it will cause the cell to change. Even exercise will do that, right? That's how we get these wonderful adaptations through exercise is we provide a stimulus. That stimulus is the exercise. We know that the exercise can be a somewhere on the continuum of various intensities, various frequencies, various durations, um, and the cells will adapt to those stimuli. If you have high intensity exercise, you'll get a certain adaptation. If you have a low intensity exercise, you'll get a certain adaptation. If you have aerobic, you'll have a certain adaptation, series of adaptations. If you have anaerobic and strength training, you'll have various adaptations that occur from that type of stimulus. So the how the the internal systems in our body, the cellular world, interprets information is from the stimulus that we give the body. And as I said, that could be that can be anything from food to diet to sleep, sleep deprivation, drinking, um, you know, toxins in the air. They all 
have to, they will all have an impact on cellular processes. Now, on the flip side of this, if we go back to this and we start to think about that uh, line of communication, right? This here, we have a, a healthy line. We have a healthy system here. Everything's doing what it should. I would imagine that the inside of this phone wire here looks as something like this, right? So we can kind of go back and say, okay, this guy's giving me a visual. I appreciate that. Way to go, B. Um, when we have this working properly, this system of communication, it, it works, it's successful. And again, if I sever that line, it's not going to work anymore. So now I want you to imagine the flip side of this, which would be uh, cell towers and power lines and phone lines that look something like this. This, this is horrific. Um, I lived in Thailand for a long period of time, and this is how their phone lines and power lines look. And there's a lot of animals that find their way up here and they get, um, basically burnt to death from the, the various uh, power lines that are unsecure up here. A lot of birds get, you know, fried to a crisp. We've seen some, uh, some small little monkeys go up there and not make it back down. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is when there's any sort of disruption to the system, we lose that communication and then we get something like this. We get aggravation, we're screaming. Um, can you hear me now? The phone's not working. So the takeaway message is that based upon our lifestyle, based upon sedentary behavior, based upon dietary um, habits, based upon are we active or inactive, we can have a system that looks like this, or we can have a system that looks like this. And this analogy is hopefully going to kind of draw a picture for you uh, in your head, because what I'm going to show you next is cellular processes. And um, we will not go this deep. You will go this deep when you get into a PhD program if you decide to do that. Um, but I just want to show you how there's some resemblance with this hot mess and a lot of the processes that are happening in the cell on a chemical level or on a molecular level. Um, so here's this guy. He's upset again. And I have this here. And I put these two side by side because you can see um, here's the lipid bilayer, right? And then we have these different receptors here. We have that G coupled protein receptor. We're not going to talk, talk much about that here. We have an inflammatory receptor here. We have a growth factor receptor. You guys know what growth factors are. Um, here we have IL three, IL three B. Here's another inflammatory receptor. Here's a hormone receptor. Um, this is a toll like receptor, which plays a role in inflammation. And then this is how the outside world of the cell communicates with the inside world and it does so through this phospholipid bilayer with its membrane which we'll talk a bit about today uh, and these various types of receptors which we'll talk about a couple and when these uh, ligands let me just kind of draw something here for you guys so you can get a, a nice kind of understanding of this we have um, these ligands or we have these molecules I'm going to put one here 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 and I'm going to put one here and we have these molecules that float around in the blood. They leave the blood. They enter the interstitial space where the cells all live. And somehow or another, these messages, right? These are different messages. Well, these ligands, we call them L-I-G-A-N-D-S. These things will bind to a receptor. And when they bind to a receptor, they're going to activate the stream. We call this downstream. And I know if you guys were in my biochemistry class, you remember that. But we have downstream modulators, right, which will propagate. I want you to remember that word, propagate a signal. So if we have, um, let's say we have this uh, cytokine receptor. If we have a, let's, let's do the IL-1. This is an inflammatory receptor. If we have a ligand bind to this receptor, uh, it has to be a very specific shape or it can't bind, right? So let's just imagine that this ligand, right? This message, this messenger looks like a U, right? And it will fit perfectly in that receptor. Now, if it fits perfectly, it's going to activate IRAK, TRAFG. TRAFG is then going to become phosphorylated and communicate with ASK and MEKK1. These are all just, we call these modulators or we call these... Um, intermediate signaling molecules, right? Because they're intermediate, intermediate because they're between the receptor and ultimately the DNA, right? So what I'm trying to show you here is that we have all these things at play, right? And ultimately they have to, if you follow these lines, they kind of show you what they interact with or what they inhibit. 
Um, and ultimately they're all trying to get their way into the nucleus, right? That's what this little orb is here. And in the nucleus, we know we have DNA. And once these messages get propagated from here to here, right? These are like relays, right? Like this guy relays the message to this guy and this guy, uh, obviously he moves inside of the nucleus, right? So he translocates into the nucleus and then he binds to DNA and then he makes something, right? He spits something back out because then we get some, like some sort of protein production from that. So what I'm trying to show you here is if you look at this hot mess and you look at this hot mess, it's real easy to see how something can go wrong, right? If this all functions accurately, we have health. If one little guy says, you know what, I'm out of here. Let's say it's PKC, right? Protein kinase C. Let's say he's like, I'm out of here. I'm done. Well, then he can't activate RAF1. He can't activate BRAF. And then that can't activate MEC. So if this guy says, I'm out of here, I'm going home. You guys figure it out without me. Whatever is signaling this protein, it stops here. It can't propagate down there. And then we lose whatever protein this protein protein kinase C was involved in making. So that's how this misregulation or this dysregulation can lead to a disease. And I just wanted to show you these pictures side by side because they, they truly are very similar. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide here. So let me get my cursor back. Okay, here we go. Okay. So we are talking about the cell and we are talking about pathology. And if we look at the, the um, patho, right, it means suffering or disease, okay? And ology would be the study. And so pathology is the study of suffering and disease. And if we look at cellular pathology, well, cellular pathology is the study of cellular abnormalities. And that's what we will be focusing on um, in this course is not only, not only the disease itself, but the alterations in the cell that initiate um, the pathogenesis of a disease. Okay. So how a disease starts. So before we move on into starting to talk about some content, I just want to go back here and say, um, this is a, a moment where I can kind of put you guys in the right direction. Everything I spoke about here, you do not need to memorize. You do not need to know. Um, I'm just showing you a concept. So when you're studying this, be like, okay, I need to know what this does, this does, this does. And as you get better at this, uh, at pathology and kind of these cellular things, you're going to want to know what they are. I, I promise you, you're going to be like, oh, this is, this is super interesting. What, what does this do? And what, how does this interact with this? Um, but for the time being, I just want you to understand the concept. Okay. So what he said is the cell has these lines of communication and he showed me, this picture, which means, uh, you know, everything can work really well and be organized and, and well thought out, well constructed, and everybody's playing nice together, or th this can happen where we have this hot mess or, you know, the lines of communication are down. And when lines of communication are down in a cell that leads to problems. So that's, that's the takeaway, right? And if one of these lines get knocked down, it's going to leave, lead to problems. If everything here, if you're taking care of yourself, you're exercising, you're not smoking, you're not drinking, um, you're not going into tanning beds, you're um, not going to Los Angeles and spending a lot of time in that ominous uh, smog that is just hovering above everybody and uh, killing them incrementally day by day then you're going to have a healthy system. But when you put your body in certain, certain positions or dispositions where toxins, viruses, bacteria, um, particles, lead, and things that are d dangerous to our, our system, when you're in those environments, that can lead to disruption of all this. And certain things are more sensitive to disruption than others. So just keep in mind that um, we're, all, we're, all we're focusing on is on the concept Okay, I will tell you when you need to focus on the details, but right now we're just talking about the concept. So ideally, something starts here, communicates with a uh, receptor of some sort, a specific receptor. We know that the receptor and the ligand, uh, they have to be mutually exclusive, which means this has to fit this, okay? Uh, if this guy here is a cytokine, it cannot bind to a growth factor um, 
receptor. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, we have these transmembrane proteins here, and I call them a transmembrane protein because they're a receptor made out of proteins. And we can see they go through the membrane, right? This one goes through the membrane seven times, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six times. I haven't studied G-coupled protein receptors in a while. Um, so they're transmembrane proteins because they go across the membrane. Um, and that's how the outside world activates these mediators on the inside of the cellular world and ultimately the goal is to turn on uh, the genes and create something right maybe maybe uh, you'll create another receptor let's just say for the sake of argument that this ligand binds here this ligand activates all these downstream mediators uh, then it goes into the the uh, nucleus and binds to the DNA and what product does it make Maybe it puts another receptor in there. So maybe it received a message to make more receptors. And that happens a lot with diseases. They call that gain of function. Or you can have loss of function. You can have something start wiping these receptors out. And then those receptors can't, here's that word, communicate with the DNA anymore, right? So the receptors play a major role in pathology. The um, plasma membrane can play a major role in pathology. The mediators in here can play a major role in pathology. And there's about a million other things, which we will never cover unless you go to med school and you'll maybe cover uh, a sliver of those million things that can go wrong in here and change the DNA and change the cell, right? So obviously if we are making more of these receptors and they're popping up all over the membrane, well, that's going to change the function of the cell. So keep that in mind. All right, let's move on. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the genome. You guys know what this is. I need to go over it again because when we're talking about cancer, when we're talking about um, different types of diseases such as diabetes or cystic fibrosis, um, we start to run into things where there's changes in the genome. So you guys know all this information, right? Um, the genome contains uh, 3.2 billion base pairs, but the most, so you know, the base pairs, right? Uh, with DNA, we have two strands of DNA in this helix formation. We know that the base pairs uh, are basically interacting with one, one another through bonds. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, just to refresh your mamie, your, no, mamie memory, sorry. Um, which is more, most interesting part though, is only 1.5% will actually code for proteins, right? So we call these coding genes. Um, and I'll show you pictures of what coding genes are um, in, a, in, a, in a moment. And the remaining, the, the other, you know, 3.1 billion are basically non-coding genes. And we call these dark matter. Uh, so a very small sliver of your genome is actually used to make proteins. And if I go back to this picture, that's what this is here, right? Making proteins. Okay. Um, so, uh, coding genome is similar across most species. I do believe that there's only like a 1.75% difference between most animals on the, on earth. Uh, so th the only thing that separates you from an alligator is 1.5 to 2% change in the genome. So the human genome is really not much different than the genome of, uh, let's say a two toed sloth, but there's, there's a very small differences that make us human and make them two toed sloth. So, um, keep that in mind. Um, and this is a very, very, very complex organ, and we're going to talk about its complexity uh, in a moment here. And this is going to be one of those, this next slide is going to be a bit long winded. So, um, one of the reasons I love doing the lectures via video is because when you get tired of hearing me drone on or you're becoming overwhelmed or too much information is coming your way at one time, you can pause and you can stop and you can rewind and you can kind of look at the picture and listen to what I'm saying and you can kind of put these things together. So let's, um, let's take a quick lo look at the genome. So here it is, uh, the genome in all of its glory and all of its beauty. And we're going to kind of go through some of these pieces here. We're going to talk about the nucleus, talk about the ribosome, uh, euchromatin, uh, heterochromatin, and the telomeres, um, chromosome itself, um, and then get into some of these uh, base pair relationships here, DNA, and talk about mRNA and how mRNA is going to help make uh, certain proteins, right? So you guys know this. We've been through this a, a thousand times. But what we're looking at here 
in this picture as a whole is all the nuclear composition of the genome in a cell. So these are all the major players. Here we can see we can see the nucleus, and here we can see the nucleolus right here. Um, this is where, of course, the ribosomal DNA is made, right, in the nucleolus. Um, we can also see the heterochromatin and the euchromatin, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, here we can see the chromosome, and just really quick, what is chromatin, right? So you see this word here, chromatin, here we see chromatin, here you see it, here you... But what, what is that? So chromatin is, is basically the DNA packed around proteins, all right? We have the two basic forms of chromatin. We have the, the euchromatin, right, which you guys can see right here. And, you know, when you're studying this, just say, okay, what is it? Okay, he defined it. He showed me where it is. This is what it is, right? So the euchromatin is essentially the less densely packed and more readily available um, genetic information for gene transcription and translation, right? So this means that it's it's more readily available to be um, approached by a DNA polymerase that will help basically transcribe information, right? So if we look here, okay, here it is right here. And then if we kind of zoom in on it here, here it is, right? And this says that it's active, right? So it's ready, it's ready to be uh, engaged by a polymerase and to make transcription occur. Where we have heterochromatin, that's going to be the opposite. This is more densely packed and is transcriptionally unavailable for gene expression. So here it says inactive. So dense, inactive, less densely packed and active. So I might say, hey guys, what are the two forms of chromatin and what are the differences? And you can say, oh, well, this is what it is, okay? I'm not going to ask you what the nucleolus of the nucleus is. Um, we're not going to spend much time on that, but I, I might ask you something about these two. So just, just keep in mind that uh, this one is ready to make protein. It's ready to make transcription, make mRNA, uh, and ready to make some type of protein complex um, through the process of translation. Um, and the chromosome, which is here, right? You guys know exactly what that is. So let's just kind of talk a, a little about, about that. Uh, chromosomes are also chromatin, but they're even more densely packed um, than what we had talked about with these two here, right? So they're super, super densely packed. Uh, and why are they packed so densely? Well, that's regulation, right? We don't want anything getting in here and communicating with the genes or telling the genes to... Uh, expose themselves. Um, I, that's funny. If I said genes and expose, it kind of takes you uh, into the gutter. And I never put that together before. And I've been talking about this for a very long time, right? This is so comp this is so tightly uh, and densely packed, so nothing can get in there and tell the gene to start making proteins, right, or to start transcription, uh, so that we can make proteins. So that's a regulation, right? Um, and then when you get to the hetero and the U uh, chromatin, it, it goes very, very tightly packed, a little less tightly packed, and this is open and ready to be uh, read by a DNA polymerase, right? So they're, they're kind of three different versions of the same thing, and, and they all really just have to do with how tightly um, the, the, the chromatin is, is packed, all right? Um, we also have, oops, sorry, I just hit the, hit the wrong button. I apologize. Let me go back. Oh, my goodness. Okay, here we go. We also have the telomeres or the telomeres. You guys should know what this is. This is basically uh, the cap or um, the cap at the terminal of the chromosome. So we have them here and here. Um, these are very important in protecting the chromosomes during cell division. Um, and the telomere length, or the telomere, however you want to say it, is an indicator of cellular senescence. So um, can I zoom in here? I won't let me zoom in. So these telomeres, or telomeres, they have certain lengths. And as the cell gets older, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And that is an indicator of how old the cell is. And when we talk about cellular senescence, we're talking about cellular aging, right? Um so, uh, yeah, this is one of the indicators that tell us how, what kind of shape a cell is in. Um, now, there's also enzymes called telomerase, which can kind of come over here and rebuild these telomeres and, and basically slow down the aging process of uh, the cell. 
And um, you know, there's there's a lot of research out there that says that exercise, aerobic exercise, uh, diets that are high in plant matter, these things all kind of help activate telomerase or telomerase, and that helps elongate these caps. And if you can't imagine what these caps look like, um, just imagine that your shoelaces are chromosomes. And those little plastic things at the end of your shoelaces, those are telomeres or telomeres. And as the shoes get older, those plastic caps at the end of your shoelaces, they get a little more frayed and, and beat up, uh, which is an indicator of how old the shoes are, right? If they're if those plastic caps are completely split and not in there anymore, I would imagine those shoes are pretty beat up and it, it may be time to go get yourself a, a new pair of uh, Jordan Air Force Ones or something. Um, so that is the telomere, okay? We also have the um, centromere here, which is basically... Uh, imagine this being like stitching, right, uh, which kind of keeps the chromosome together, right? So we have the telomeres, which are the caps, the centromere, which kind of keeps the chromosome all together, uh, keeps the chromo chromosomes like connected. Um, and then we can kind of move down here. Um, so the chromatin, so the chromatin um, is basically comprised of nucleosomes so let's look at this here look at this little uh this little unit here right and you can see here we have all these nucleosomes right so if we go if we kind of zoom in on the chromosome and you can see here it's unwinding and if it's unwinding guys what is it doing well it's becoming a heterochromatin because this is super compact this is not compact at all. And then look at this here. This would be your euchromatin, where it's very active and ready to be accessed. And what is going to be accessed? Well, that is going to be the nucleosome. And the nucleosome are these structural subunits of DNA-based pairs. So if we kind of unwind these, these it's like a spool of thread, right? If we unwind this, we can see that this is where the DNA the double band helix and the base pairs are at. All right. Um, so take a couple of minutes and just say, let's kind of say, okay, we have, we have the nucleus and in the nucleus, we have chromosomes and in chromosomes, we have the centromere. And then we have this chromosome, which is like a very, very compact, um, unit of DNA and genetic information. And then we have these two subunits of chromosomes, which are called chromatin. Um, and we have one that is a little more densely packed. Here is that guy just for the sake of visuals. And then we have one that is open and active and ready to engage. And that is this guy here, right? So hopefully that, that makes sense. And I'm definitely going to ask you some questions on these just so you can identify, um, what these things are. Uh, it's important to know, because when we get deeper into the text, it's going to refer to these things. Um, and at the very bottom here, right? If we look at this DNA, um, we can see that it is wrapped around these little spools here, and these are called histones, okay? So we have histones in which the DNA wraps around it tightly, and it's tightly so nothing can interact with it, and we call that a nucleosome. You guys probably know this already. Um, and then if we kind of zoom in on the DNA here, we can see this kind of promoter, single strand of DNA. And you can see that there is a promoter unit, an exon, an intron, an exon, an enhancer, and then another exon. Okay. So here we have what we were talking about with um, the dark matter and the genetic information that we can actually create proteins with. And you guys should know that let me just go here really quick, and that way we can kind of look at it a little more. Here's the chromosome, right? We know that the chromosome contains chromatin. We know that the, that the chromatin contains nucleosomes. We know that the nucleosomes contain histones that have DNA wrapped around it. Here we have the uh, heterochromatin, and then we get the euchromatin. And then we have these things called exons, and we have these things called introns. And exons and introns are basically material that is coding protein or non-coding protein. So let's just kind of go back a little bit. Let me find that slide. 
I told you here, I think this is right here. Yep. The human genome contains roughly 3.2 million, I'm sorry, billion DNA base pairs and only 1.5% of it is used to code for proteins. So let's go back to that slide here. And we can see that that 1.5% exists in the exons, right? So we have exons and introns. The introns, which is blue, this is non-coding information. This is dark matter. This is information that um, is a regulator of how the exons will be approached and how the information in the exons are going to be expressed. So if I asked you guys, which is more important, exons that actually make proteins or the introns, which regulate how proteins are made, that's a trick question because they're both super, super, super important. And that's one of the major concepts that we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So we know that the exons make the protein. So let's go back here. We can see a promoter unit. The promoter unit is usually what attracts and binds the DNA polymerase. So basically a protein will bind here and then we will start the process of transcription. So we know that the exon can be transcribed. The intron can't. The exon can be transcribed. The intron can't. But you can see that in the introns, we have promoters and we have enhancers. And these are things that regulate how the exon is going to be uh, transcribed. So yes, this is important because it's creating a protein, but the information that precedes it is equally important because this region is going to tell the DNA polymerase how to engage this and what to do with it and where to start transcription or where to stop transcription, right? So that's what these these like traffic signals is per se, right? They, they basically tell the DNA polymerase how to engage the gene, okay? And then we know that once we have transcription that occurs, we get a unit of messenger RNA, and that RNA is going to go to the ribosome where genetic information will interact with the ribosome. It will undergo translation, which means amino acids are going to be brought to the ribosome, and it's going to take this genetic information and translate it into protein information. And now we have a protein that is made. So this is kind of, as I said, this is the genome, and the genome is all of the nuclear composition, of the genome in the cell. That's what this picture represents. All the nuclear composition, right? All of this is essential for gene uh, expression and protein production. And it's very easy to see how something can go wrong very quickly. All right. So that was one of my long winded kind of um, my long winded uh, slides there. So let's move on to base pairs. So let's kind of look at this for a second. You guys know what this is, just refreshing your memory. Um, so if we're looking at the DNA here, right, we know that this is a nucleosome. This is a histone. We know that the histone uh, basically allows the DNA to wrap itself around it. So that way the DNA is not exposed to anything when it's not ready to be exposed. And here we can see the base pairs. You guys know what these base pairs are, right? We got T, which bases, uh, which um, pairs with A. We have C that pairs with G. Here we have C that pairs with G. Here we have A that pairs with T. So we know that these are the base pairs, and we know these things kind of hang on to one, of the another, uh, one another through hydrogen bonds, okay? Um, this is all review. You guys should absolutely know what this is already. Um, and let's move on to the next slide. So uh, I already talked about this. Uh, let me just talk a little more. Um, this is also going to be reflective of this, right? So it's kind of just two different representations of the same picture. Um, so I can show you this, or I can show you this. It's essentially the same thing. So um, since we already talked about this one, uh, let's talk about this one. So we have, again, what do the exons do? If you don't know, come back here. Exons are basically genetic information that are coding. So here we have the exons, and sorry, it's a little confusing because the color has changed here. Here we have the introns, exons, introns. Um, we know that the exons contain genetic and information and the introns are considered the dark matter. Um, so when scientists search for genetic mutations, so let's talk about genetic mutations a little bit because this is where we start to run into problem. This is where we start to uh, run into the development of certain diseases. 
um, when scientists basically search for genetic mutations that cause human disease, they generally tend to look into protein coding DNA. So they look here, right? Um, because it makes sense that alterations in protein production might lead to alterations in cell function. Um, and we know that this is comprised of the exons, and exons are also called genes, right? Coding genes. Um, the vast majority of the diseases that are caused by mutations, they lie within the protein coding DNA. So many of them do lie here. But the reason we say that is because we know more about exons than we do introns. We know more about exons than we knew this kind of, they call it dark matter or they call it junk DNA. We know more about it. The exons are more well studied. Um, so even though, even though these exons only make up one to 2% of the human genome, like I told you, this is where a lot of the problems can happen. All right. So the remaining 98% of the genome, this here, the introns, which we are calling dark matter, um, the function of the DNA sequence in the dark matter is less clear. And interpreting the effects of genetic change is, is very difficult in this. So we're still trying to figure out what this is um, and what it does and how it functions holistically within, within DNA and the genome. So uh, dark matter is generally composed of promoters and enhancers and repressors uh, and also transcription factor binding sites. So one of the things you're going to need to know uh, and keep this in mind is that much of the dark matter, much of the introns are promoters. Okay. You guys know what a promoter is that basically signals for the, the, the protein that is going to transcribe to bind here. And that way it can transcribe this genetic information. It uh, is also composed of enhancers, right? So maybe, uh, maybe there needs, there's an enhancing signal, which tells the protein to transcribe something differently. There's also repressors, right? So we can say if we, let's go, let's say that this guy here is a repressor sequence and it says, okay, once this protein reads this sequence of base pairs, um, it's going to tell it to not do a certain type of transcription here. It's repressing the transcription here. All right. Um, and there's also some hotspots and hotspots are revealed, um, they basically revealed recurring mutations that can exist in the dark matter. Uh, and these are associated with cancer development. So some of these things have hotspots where there's uh, information that kind of reoccurs and reoccurs and reoccurs. And these hotspots, these reoccurring mutations are um, super strongly associated with the development of cancer. Okay. So I want to give you guys a little quiz now here because I want you to think of all of this information conceptually, all right? So how do these things work together? How do the, let's, the, let's say the introns, which contain promoters, right? This is an intron, essentially. This could be a repressor, which is also an intron. So we know that the introns are traffic signals per se, right? They say, stop here, read this, slow down read this, S uh, skip this. Um, so the introns are the directors. They're, they're like the directors of the orchestra. They tell the protein, the DNA polymerase, how to read the, inf the genetic information, right? So if you ask me, the signals telling the protein DNA polymerase how to read the genetic information is just as important as the genetic information. Because if something goes wrong here, that means, like I told you at the beginning of the lecture, it's a domino effect. This goes wrong, this goes wrong, this goes wrong, this goes wrong. And if everything downstream this way of the promoter region is um, not being read correctly because the promoter region is mutated, well, then do we get the mRNA? We might, it might be a mutated version or it might be a version missing information, which means then we get, a, we get a protein that is not 
a normal protein that we would get in the cell. And if we get a, a, a dysfunctional or, or a protein that is not normal in the cell, that's going to change how the cell responds or how the cell functions. Okay. So all of these things, I mean, why, why in this, all of these things matter. So I'm going to ask you a question now, which of the following would have an effect on gene expression? I want you to think conceptually. Yes. I gave you guys a lot of information to memorize, but most of it has been review, right? We, we talked about all this. You should know all, what all this is. I, I put some extra little arrows here just to say, Hey guys, focus your attention on this information here. We talked about promoters, exons, introns, exons, enhancers, suppressors, all that information. So the, the big question now I'm going to ask you is what happens if, if which of the following would have an effect on gene expression, if we had a mutation in the exon. So if there were mutations within the DNA in the exon, the genetic information that the DNA polymerase reads to transcribe or transcribes to make a protein. If there's a mutation there, uh, is that going to affect gene expression? If there's a mutation on the introns, right? So the, the traffic signals, the things that tell the DNA polymerase to stop, slow down, bind here, skip this. Uh, if there's a mutation there, is that going to impact gene expression? If there's a mutation on the pro promoter region where basically it's saying, Hey, this is an intron that's saying, Hey, DNA polymerase bind here. So you can start reading the information here, or is it all the above? So remember, let me just give you one more thing before you answer. Remember the reason I showed you this is because this is everything that impacts gene expression. Remember, I told you that this is, um, all of the nuclear composition of the genome in a cell. Okay. So if I said, which one is more important and you said, well, you know, this is more important than this. Not true. They're all equally important. So what you should have decided here is that, yeah, all the above. And as I said, in that last slide, there's hot spots and hot spots is where there's a lot of mutations side by side. And if a promoter region is mutated and the exon that's next to it is mutated, and then the next intron is mutated. Now you have hot spots. Now you have changes in gene expression that are going to be catastrophic to the cell and could lead to things uh, like cancer or different diseases. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And this is, um, this is something that is going to be conceptual as well. Um, so here we can see the basic structure of hemoglobin and hemoglobin is made up of both beta subunits. So we have beta one, beta two. These are also called beta globin, right? So beta globin one, beta globin two. And down here, we also have two alpha subunits. So we would have alpha globin one and alpha globin two. Now, in order for red blood cells to function properly, these, uh, once oxygen binds to the heme group right here, right? Um, this structure will go through a small conformational change, which will basically expose these heme groups, um, to bind faster and quicker and more efficiently to oxygen. So if for some reason we had a condition where beta globin one and beta globin two were not present, what would that do to the red blood cells ability to bind oxygen? So you should be saying, well, it would be cut in half. Absolutely. It would be cut in half. And if we had red blood cells that only had alpha subunits and could only bind oxygen on alpha subunits, what would that do to oxygen saturation in the lungs? Well, you should say, okay, well, it will be cut in half. Yes, you're right. It would be cut in half. And if we had red blood cells that only had alpha one and alpha two, uh, globin units, what would that do to oxygen delivery to necessary tissue like the brain and the liver and, uh, skeletal muscle that require oxygen? Well, it would cut it in half, right? So it would cut all that in half and the payload, uh, of oxygen being delivered to, tissue that demands it such as, uh, the heart, right? The heart is primarily aerobic. It uses a lot of oxygen. What happens to that tissue? If something as simple as a red blood cell 
uh, it cuts it cuts its oxygen delivery capacity in half. Well, now that tissue is compromised. So let's go back to the communication, right? I told you guys from the beginning, it's a domino effect. So something as simple as the red blood cell will impact the entire system, uh, the entire uh, physiological system. And what we're looking at here is I, I have, this is just kind of a representation very similar to this. Let me just go back to this, right? Right. We talked about promoters, exons, introns, right? So if you just kind of keep this in mind, and then we move over here to this slide, it's essentially the same thing, just slightly different. But this is the gene here, right? This is the exon that transcribes for beta globin. And here's beta one and beta two. And if there's any issues, with this gene, whether it's a promoter region or an exon or an intron or whatever it is, uh, that's going to cause issues with um, messenger RNA production. So it's going to cause issues with translation. I'm sorry, transcription, messenger RNA, and then translation, right? So now we're, we're kind of going backwards. So if there's a problem here, there's going to be a problem here. And if there's a problem here, there's going to be a problem in the rest of the body. So now we're getting into the heart of pathology. So um, what happens here is when we have mutations in this gene, right, this beta globin gene, we develop something called beta thalassemia, okay, thalassemia, T-H-A-L-A-S-S. E-M-I-A, I think that's it. Okay. And it's kind of, it's kind of a tongue twister, thalassemia. Um, it's basically a blood disorder that reduces the production of hemoglobin. And that reduction is going to come in the beta subunits, which is why we call it beta thalassemia. Um, now what happens is if we look at, um, let's look at the boxes here, right? Here are boxes where there are mutations that can occur in the development of this disease. So just here in the promoter region, we can have one, two, three, four, four mutations that can occur that can lead to alterations in how this gene is read and the ultimate product of that gene. So if we look at, look at the difference between these, right? So here's obviously the base pairs, right? And we can see that the base pairs uh, or I'm sorry, this is not base pairs. This is sequencing because we're, now we're just dealing with one line of DNA. Uh, this is CCAA, CACC, C, uh, so here's one that's similar. And then we have ATAAA. So we can have mutations just in the promoter region that can lead to the deletion of these beta subunits. All right. So that's, that's kind of a cool way to think of this. And the reason I'm using this example is just to kind of show you that what starts at the DNA will ultimately impact the protein. And if the protein is uh, deleted or changed or altered, it's going to impact uh, the physiology. Okay. Um, and then um, we can see that uh, there's also some mutations that can occur here at the three prime region, which would be maybe the stop sequence or the repressor. So um, this is showing you how important the introns are, right? the stop signals or, or the traffic signals that tell how to read a gene, right? Um, and we can also have mutations in here, right? We can have mutations in the introns. Um, so what I'm showing you here is that there's a lot of places where things can go wrong here. And if, thing go, if things go wrong in gene expression, then things are going to go wrong in protein production. And if things go wrong in protein production, uh, we are going to have problems in physiology, which is welcome to the world of diseases, right? We, we said that it's the study of suffering, right? Um, and obviously, if your ability to bring in uh, oxygen because you develop a blood disease called um, beta, left, beta leucemia, sorry about that, um, thalassemia, I got to keep stuttering on that, um, you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to have complications, okay? Um, let's move on to the next slide and talk about a takeaway message here. Okay, so the takeaway from all of this is that the human genome uh, has coding sequences and non-coding sequences. And we know that those sequences can be mutated. We know that those introns and exons, um, 
they both can have mutations. We know promoter regions can have mutations. And we know if the mutations occur, we're going to have complications or alterations to messenger RNA. And if we have complications to messenger RNA, we're going to have changes in um, protein production, right? We're going to have changes in the ribosome. We're going to have different amino acids being brought. Um, and that's going to make a different protein that might falter or might be dysfunctional. All right, so that is how all of that works. All right, so we talked about the genome. We talked about all of the pieces of the genome. We talked about some of the factors, including exons, introns, promoter regions, uh, how those can be mutated. If we have multiple mutations, uh, we start losing regulation of gene expression. We start to make uh, some pretty wacky proteins. And when, we, when we're making some wacky proteins, we get some wacky uh, changes in cell function. So now uh, that we've focused on the DNA, let's talk a little bit about RNA. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how RNA can be changed. So we already know that uh, what messenger RNA is, right? So, we'll, so here's that picture again. We got the DNA, we got the base pairs. Um, we know that when DNA is transcribed, these base pairs are separated and DNA polymerase will transcribe just a single strand of the DNA, right? It doesn't transcribe both of them. And then when it transcribes that, we get uh, this messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA goes to the ribosome to make protein. So we, we know about that. Um, but there are some other messenger RNA, or I'm sorry, there's some other RNAs that we have to talk about too. Uh, one of them is tRNA. And we know that the tRNA is the uh, RNA that is responsible for assembling this protein, right? That's the one that's going to basically bring the amino acids to the ribosome and basically start matching these codons to the RNA uh, transcript here that, that goes into the ribosome. So you guys know what that is. And then we also have ribosomal RNA, which we're not going to talk about. I think the book mentions it. I have a picture of it here. Um, but we, we're not going to talk about it just because we have too many other things to do. Um, but all of these are, as you can see, are clearly, clearly important for gene expression. Okay. So not only DNA, but the various RNAs that help assemble the proteins are, uh, important. So you can see how the more layers we put on this, uh, with complexity, the easier it is for certain things to go wrong. Um, so it, it's a very sensitive, uh, system that we're dealing with here and, 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 and the disruptions that can happen, um, uh, are, are, it's very easy to occur, especially as we start to get older. Um, so these things, uh, are non-coding and they also belong to the dark matter. So messenger RNA, tRNA and, um, ribosomal RNA are, are part of that dark matter. Um, so therefore RNAs are not directly involved in gene structure and gene expression. Um, but they play a role in uh, regulating and modulating it. Okay. So they're mediators per se of gene expression. Um, let's talk a little bit about some RNAs that you might not be familiar with. Um, two of them are very important. One of them, um, not really. So we also have these things called miRNA, and these are called micro RNAs and they're naturally occurring in our, in our body. And they're micro because they're very short RNA molecules, which can bind to target messenger RNAs, right? So these things are, they can bind to messenger RNA and they can, and when they bind, they can alter messenger RNA. So they can repress it. They can silence a gene. They can, they can basically interfere. They can interrupt with uh, gene expression. So, uh, obviously these micro RNAs, they could be good guys. They could be bad guys. It kind of depends on, um, the situation that we're talking about, but they can interfere or disrupt gene expression by binding to messenger RNA. Um, they're kind of involved in many cellular functions such as development and differentiation of cells and growth and metabolism. And, uh, these things are all kind of regulated by micro RNAs. All right. So we have another layer of complexity. Um, micro RNAs have been studied, um, as a likely candidate for the involvement in most biological processes and have been implicated in many diseases. Okay. So 
on top of the DNA, on top of the messenger RNA, on top of the tRNA, on top of the ribosomal RNA, we now have these micro RNAs, which modulate some of these processes and they can begin kind of acting up and being wacky. And if they do so, they can play a major role in the development of cancer and other diseases. Um, and these things are naturally occurring, right? So, uh, let's think, let me see if I can find that slide. Let's go back here. Right. Uh, where is that at? Here it is. Right. One thing goes wrong in all of this. One thing says, you know what? I don't want to play by your stupid rules anymore. I'm going to do my own thing and there's nothing you can do about it. Once that happens, we run into issues and micro RNAs are a candidate that have been studied, uh, qu quite a bit over the last decade. And, uh, it's been found that uh, not only do they play a role in normal processes like, like metabolism and, and such, uh, they also play a role in developing diseases, uh, siRNA, which are called small interfering RNAs, kind of similar to what we see here. These are kind of the counterpart to micro RNAs because micro RNAs can interfere with gene expression, right? They can silence, they can shut things down. Um, but we see these, uh, SI RNAs mostly in experimental models. Uh, they can be injected into cell culture and we can kind of turn things off or, uh, accelerate things or silence things. Um, so this one kind of occurs more naturally in the human body. This one is more scientific, more used in laboratories. That's why this one's really not that important. It really doesn't have a place for, uh, what we're talking about, but your textbook mentions it. And then we have these other ones, which are called long coding RNAs, and these are most abundant and they play a major role in gene expression. So these are more abundant than these are here. And long chain are, I'm sorry, um, the long chain, long coding RNAs interact with, um, basically the nuclear architecture. All right. And they are involved in fundamental biological mechanisms, such as histone coding regulation, gene activation, gene repression, which means we're going to turn the gene off. So it, it can be involved in turning the gene on or turning the gene off. It's involved in cell proliferation, which means growth of the cell. Um, so it, this thing kind of regulates a lot of, um, a lot of the processes with gene expression and it interacts directly with the DNA and the architecture of the DNA. So let's kind of, let's kind of go back here just to kind of show you, uh, uh, some pictures here. So you can see that some, so here's the DNA has very little interaction where here the DNA is absolutely completely covered in different proteins. So the long coding RNAs, they actually they actually communicate with or interact with the structure of the DNA where the micro RNAs, they, they don't do so. They don't interact with the DNA itself. So, so there's some kind of major differences between, um, those two. Now let's go back here. Um, some, a couple other things about the long chain, long coding RNAs. Um, there are several associations between alterations in this RNA and its function and how it interacts with the gene. And it has been linked to, uh, many clinical phenotypes of disease. So we have a lot of players here that can be involved in disease process, right? We know, let's just beat a dead horse. We know that promoter regions, if it's mutated, we got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Exons, which is gene expression region. This is where we create proteins. If it's mutated Houston, we have a problem. Introns. These are the traffic signals. They tell how to read the genes, when to stop, when to start, how fast, how slow. Uh, if we have mutations here, Houston, we have a problem. If we have mutations on all of these, and then we get a mutated RNA, Houston, we have a problem. So if the, if the RNA, the messenger RNA is mutated, let me go up here. Let's tie all these pieces together. Well, if this is mutated messenger RNA, tRNA is going to bring the wrong amino acids, right? Does that make sense? You see how all this is coming together. And if the wrong amino acids are brought, then ladies and gentlemen, what do we have? We have a mutated protein. And if we have a mutated protein, we have mutation, we have, we have alterations in function and alterations in, um, in, in, uh, what the protein does in the cell. And not only do we have these problems, but we also have alterations in 
microRNA, right? This thing can kind of go haywire and start binding to certain messenger RNAs and just shutting them off. That could be problematic. Uh, we have long coding RNAs, which can bind to uh, the actual gene itself, the DNA architecture and start modulating gene expression. So there's a, there's a lot of space for things to go wrong. Um, and that's all I really have on the genome. So now we're going to talk about some other important structures and functions that can be alterated uh, negatively in a disease state. Uh, so let's talk about that. So now let's move out of uh, the DNA, let's move out of the genome, let's move out of the nucleus, uh, and let's kind of move upwards. Let's go upstream to uh, some other important structures that are going to play a role in initiating or, or uh, you know, uh, changing as a result of a, a disease. So um, basically a cell can survive only in the following, if the following housekeeping functions are performed on a regular basis. So uh, these are things that are going to keep a cell happy and healthy and alive and regulated and functioning under normal conditions. So uh, protection from the environment. That's what we're going to get into first with the functions of the plasma membrane. Uh, nutrient acquisition. So if we're not bringing nutrients into the cell, both micro and macro, uh, it's done for. Uh, communication. I showed you lots of pictures on communication. Uh, movements. Well, cells divide, they proliferate, they grow. Um, some cells are mobile and they, they move along, uh, certain structures within this, within, uh, the cellular, um, environment. Uh, so some of them can actually move, uh, renewal of senescent molecules. So renewal of proteins, old proteins, we got to have protein turnover. If we don't have protein turnover, uh, cells are not going to be happy, uh, molecular catabolism and energy generation. So these are, these are all the things that make a cell happy. Uh, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the protection. So we're going to be spending some time on the cell membrane here. So what is the function of the plasma membrane? You guys know what this is. This is the lipid bilayer. We have some different proteins in here that are transmembrane proteins because they go through the entire uh, lipid bilayer. So we have a part on the uh, external side of the cell, and then we have parts on the internal side of the cells. Uh, these are filaments and cytoskeletons because, like I said, certain cells can move along cytoskeletons and along uh, um, filaments. Uh, not only uh, can cells do so, but also properties within inside the cell can move along. This is like a highway, so certain things within the cell can move along these highways. Um, we have glycoproteins uh, on the cell, which is basically a protein that has been glycolated. So there's glucose that binds to this protein that can change function of the cells. We have carbohydrates that can bind to um, the lipid bilayer that can change how the lipid bilayer responds to the response to the external environment. Uh, we have glycolipids where we just like a glycoprotein, we have glyco uh, glucose that can bind to lipids. And all of these things play very important functions within uh, within the cellular environment. So you guys all know that uh, cells have the same basic set of intracellular organelles, which can be classified into two groups. We have membrous organelles, okay, are, are things that have a membrane, and then we have non-membrous organelles with things without a plasma membrane. Um, so we're going to be talking, this is kind of introducing us to uh, one of the organelles that we're going to talk about, which is the mitochondria. And you know that the mitochondria has uh, two membranes, right? It has an uh, external and an internal membrane. So that's why I'm bringing that up. And of course, the cells that we're talking about today, uh, it, it, we're going to have, um, the cell has a membrous uh, uh, lipid bilayer, and we're going to talk about that membrane and what that do, does. So Let's talk about the, the, the structure. Now, in conditions of cell stress, um, or uh, if there's other alterations that are occurring in the cellular environment, uh, the membrane can become damaged. And um, 
in many, in most diseases, uh, the cell membrane, uh, the integrity of it becomes compromised. Not only the cell membrane that su surrounds the cell, but also the membranes that surround organelles within the cell. So once you have damage to this membrane, uh, you know, one thing that is uh, strongly associated with um, lipid bilayer destruction is the development of free radicals. Um, most free radicals that uh, are produced, whether it's in diabetes or hypertension or cancer or um, liver, chronic liver disorders, um, these free radicals can bind to the lipid bilayer and, and destroy them. So, um, and that changes not only the cell, but also the tissue because the content that is contained and protected inside of the cell will spew out into the interstitial space and then once we have that, then we're going to have an inflammatory response because things that should be in the cell are now floating around in the aqueous solution that surrounds other cells. So uh, we can have chemical or functional changes that will occur that will damage these membranes and uh, the, basically are a part of the pathogenesis of certain diseases. Um, and this can, so we know that the receptors are all, are all here, so... Uh, receptor-related diseases uh, are associated with the membrane. Um, grave disease is another one that is associated with alterations or changes in membranes that are either membranes uh, surrounding the cell or membranes uh, within the cell that are surrounding organelles. Uh, definitely diabetes and obesity. Uh, there's a lot of changes in uh, the membrane, and, and this could also include the upregulation of more receptors or the downregulation of more receptors. So this, and sometimes in a disease state, uh, the receptors, uh, there will be more receptors planted inside of the membrane uh, that will help accelerate the disease and kind of uh, speed up the messages received from the outside world. Um, Multiple sclerosis is another one that has associations with alteration in membranes. Um, cystic fibrosis uh, is another one that has changes in cellular membranes. Um, it changes the permeability of, of certain things. And you can see here that the membrane is really, really important with uh, allowing certain things in and certain things out. Um, and then there's also uh, other disorders that are, are surrounding uh, changes in the membrane, whether that be that the membrane is changing as a part of the disease or when the disease is present, the membrane is changing as a result of the, of the disease. So, um, you know, the, the membrane does other, other things like uh, cell recognition. So it can recognize other cells and it uses the glycolipids and the glycoproteins on the surface uh, to do that. So these little finger-like projections here allow it to communicate with um, other cells in the environment. Uh, receptors, as I said before, this is huge in pathology. So if there's changes in receptors that are embedded into the membrane, that's going to have a, a major implication on how quickly the disease accelerates. Uh, and also the membrane is important for major, major, major processes such as endo and exocytosis, which is what we are going to talk about next. And we're just going to focus more on the endocytosis over the exocytosis. So let's get on to this next slide here. Um, now, I have uh, quite a bit of pictures here, and I warned you previously that this is going to be the one that I'm going to be a bit long-winded on. Uh, so just give me a moment to kind of go through all of this. So what is what is endocytosis and exocytosis? Well, these are basically the processes by which cells move materials in or out of the cell. Um, so some things that are too large to pass through the lipid bilayer or some things that are too large to pass through ion channels, uh, they need another means of getting into the cell. So if we got to get cargo into the cell, we have to do it through a process called endocytosis, which is when the membrane becomes invaginated, as you can see here, and these invaginations ultimately turn into vesicles. So you can see here, uh, caviolin, this is a protein here. Um, caviolin is responsible for invagination in the membrane and then clipping of the membrane so that we actually have a vesicle. And you can see another one here uh, that is done. I think these are clathrins. Uh, clathrins are another protein that do that. Uh, we have 
invagination, and then we have a vesicle, and we can see that these things are moving into the cell. Um, so this is how we get things past a bilayer. And if, if a lipid bilayer is compromised for some reason, well, what, what does that mean? That means that endo and exocytosis are going to be compromised. So there you can see another kind of layering effect of how these things can go horribly, horribly wrong. Um, so large molecules and microorganisms and waste products are some of these substances that are moved in and out of the cell. So just like, just like uh, most living creatures, we have excrement that we have to get rid of. Well, cells have waste products too that they have to get rid of, and they do that by exocytosis. And what exocytosis is, is the opposite of endocytosis. So endo means in and exo means out. So we get rid of things through the lipid bilayer as well. So Let's talk more about endocytosis. This is a process of engulfing macromolecules and other substances, I'm sorry, substances uh, from the surrounding medium, okay? And this, you can see here, is engulfing, right? Invagination, vesicle formation, and it's been engulfed. Invagination, vesicle formation, and the product has been engulfed, and now it can move within the cell, okay? So we have channels. We guys know that we have ion channels. You guys have studied a lot with ion channels, whether it be sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Uh, small micronutrients can easily pass through ion channels. And we know that some of these ion channels are voltage gated. Some of them are a concentration gradient. Some of them require ATP, which will actively transport some out and some in, right? So we know that the smaller macromolecules uh, micromolecules can get in. Um, but when we have these larger ones, we need assistance from the membrane to do so. Um, so caviolins here, you don't really need to know what this is, but the caviolins are a family of membrane proteins that are basically principal proteins involved in endocytosis. Now, one thing you need to know is that endocytosis, see here, it can happen one of two ways independently of a receptor or receptor mediated and receptor dependent. So if we have independent endocytosis, it's a result of these caviolin proteins, which means there's less regulation. So if we have a problem with the receptors and these things start acting haywire um, and they don't wanna play nicely with others, well, that means receptor mediated endocytosis will have an issue, but caviolin mediated endocytosis won't have an issue because it's not receptor mediated. So that's kind of like the major difference, okay? Um, endosomes, which you can see here, uh, where, where did it go? Give me one second to find it. Here we go, here's endosomes, okay? Um, endosomes are receptor mediated um, endocytosis vesicles, all right? So once the receptor uh, if we're talking about receptor-mediated endocytosis, once the receptor is active and we have uh, this invagination occur, and then the materials, you can see here, here's, let's say this is the ligand, it binds to the receptor. Here's the ligand, it binds to the receptor. Here's the ligand, it binds to the receptor. When we have endosome formation, it takes all of that in, right? So this this vesicle contains not only the message, but also the receptor, and it brings it into the cell. And then we basically have early endosome products and late endosome products. And the difference between that is basically that the receptors start to kind of release their ligands. Here you can see it's still bound. Here it is not bound. Don't get tied up in those details. Just understand that we have channels for small things. We don't have channels for larger materials and we have to take those in through endocytosis there's two types of endocytosis caviola mediated one which contains caviolin and receptor mediated and both of those will bring in endosomes right here's an endosome here's an endosome that's the biggest thing don't worry about all these details um uh, endosomes are basically cytosolic vesicles and you can see that here these vesicles are in the cytosol. These vesicles are in the cytosol, and they're bringing information. Or they're bring yeah, they're bringing information into the cell. Um, and very very important parts of the endocytotic process. They play a crucial role in various physiological processes, uh, such as nutrient intake, 
They sort and they deliver macromolecules to different parts of the cell. And they are a major role in basically regulating cell surface receptors um, and transportation in the cellular environment. So I had to take a quick break because as you could probably hear, my voice was starting to fade in the, uh, the last slide there. So when you're recording lectures for four to six hours a day on uh, this online virtual platform, uh, you, spend a ten, you, you tend to spend much more time talking. So, um, so what we talked about before with the endosomes and the uh, endocytosis, again, those are um, membrane enclosed organelles. And I want you to remember that because this is assigned in your reading. You guys, I, I did give you a, a reading table to tell you everything that I want you to look at and what I want you to, to read. And just know that we have a membrane enclosed um, organelle here, right? So this one is going to be the um, caviola mediated endocytosis, right? This one happens with caviolin and it's independent of the receptor. Uh, and then this one is clathrin coated pits. Uh, this one is going to use receptors. So you can see non-receptor mediated and receptor mediated. And both of these are examples of membrane enclosed organelles, right? So we have the membrane here and a part of that membrane is uh, it's sacrificing itself. It's given a piece of itself so that it can take in uh, items that are uh, large, right? That can't get through these uh, these channels. So let's talk about lysosomes now. So we can see lysosomes here. So lysosomes are another type of membrane enclosed organelle. And this contains inside of it an array of enzymes. And some of them are digestive enzymes. So they have the part, they have the potential to break down all types of bi biological proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and fats, all right? So these guys here, uh, they can interact with uh, en endosomes. You can see here that lysosome late endosome fusion vesicle, these two can fuse together. Lysosomes can also exist on their own. And basically their function is they are these kind of digestive creatures or these digestive systems within the cell. And they serve to, to degrade material that is taken from the outside of the cell and digest it um, so that it becomes a component of the cell itself. Now, lysosomes and phagocytes or phagocytosis, uh, they kind of function in a similar manner. But the big difference is phagocytosis or phagocytes, which we'll talk about uh, in, in a moment here. These are vesicles that will take in matter and also kind of redu um, get rid of debris where the lysosomes will kind of digest things and utilize it for the cell. So if an endosome brings something in, then a lysosome kind of, it can work with the endosome, endosome sorry, uh, to start um, utilizing what was brought in from the cargo. All right, so uh, you can think of the endo endosome here as kind of the mouth, right? You guys have a mouth that brings in food and nutrients and lots of Coors Lights and pizza and God knows what else. Um, so once that gets inside, then the stomach, which is I'm giving you the analogy, which is what the lysosome is, right? So if you bring in the food, the stomach digests it. Uh, the lysosome acts as the stomach where it kind of can break these things down. And it also adds, a, it also acts kind of like the small intestines where it becomes a source where it can distribute and um, help utilize the nutrients that your mouth took in and your stomach digested. So that's that's how those things kind of function. So um, the lysosomes will break things apart using enzymes. Uh, some of them will also use reactive oxidative species, uh, break these things down, and then um, it can pass off things that it doesn't want to a phagosome, right? And then it comes a phagolysosome. So these things can all interact. They can also work independently. So if we pass material off to the phagosome and we do generate a phagolysosome, then this undigested residue material is released and this happens through exocytosis, right? So now we get rid of material here. Um, so we have materials that can come in through channels, we have bigger materials that can come in through receptor in independent mediated processes. There's no receptors here, but this caviolin makes a, it plays a big role in it. And, and I think your textbook mentions caviolin, but 
If it doesn't, just make sure you remember that. And these are just kind of proteins that help the process along the way. They help kind of snip this membrane here and it kind of becomes this membrane, membrane blurb or this enclosed vesicle that we've been talking about, right? This enclosed organelle that has a piece of the membrane in it. We can have receptor mediated processes where we have the same thing enclosed um, membranous organelle here. We have lysosomes, which can function independently or also take up uh, material that was brought in from the endosome. Uh, the lysosome has enzymes. It's enzyme rich. It can break down the material and use it and whatever it doesn't want, it's going to pass off to uh, the phagosome and the phagosome will basically get rid of it. Um, so let's talk a bit about phagosomes and phagocytosis. And uh, I'm going to see if I can find some videos to kind of help you um, visualize some of these processes as well. So you're not just looking at a two dimensional flat screen picture and trying to put it all together. Um, so both endocytosis and phagocytosis forms vesicles, right? Um, phagocytosis is generally going to handle toxins or microbes or viruses or things like that. It's going to help kind of get rid of these uh, potential toxic material uh, that's trying to get into the cell or is in the cell. Um, and then the main difference between the um, phagocytosis and endocytosis is that uh, the endo to endocytosis is taking in matter into the living cell by forming a vesicle by the cell membrane where phagocytosis is taking in large solid, solid matter into the cell by forming a phagosome, right? Which you guys can see here, right? So we have an endosome and we have a phagosome. Now in cell biology, a phagosome is a vesicle formed around a particle, which you guys can see here, right? Here's a particle, here's a vesicle formed around it. And that particle is engulfed by a phagocyte via, via phagocytosis. All right, so we have the process phagocytosis. We have a phagosome, and this is what a phagocyte does. Now, um, what is a phagocyte? So generally, what phagocytes are are immune cells. So these include macrophages, neutrophils, uh, some dendritic cells, um, and these things are formed by the fusion of the cell membrane amount around the microorganism, uh, it can happen around a sedentary cell, or it can happen around a cell that is experiencing apoptosis, right? So a cell that is that is dying, right? So so a phago a phagosome or a phagocyte, it's a scavenger, and uh, it can um, basically take in things that are necrotic or things that are dying, um, and it can consume it and make this debris. And I'm going to show you guys a video of um, how that works. All right. So uh, as I said, this process, this phagocytosis, so the main difference, guys, if you said, okay, well, he's giving us a lot of detail again, and I'm getting lost. I'm just asking you to know the main difference. We have channels on the membrane. The channels are... They, they basically pass along small particles. There's different types of way they can do it. Some some take ATP, some don't. Some use some use concentration gradients. Some use reverse concentration gradients. Some use voltage gated channels. You guys know these. Your textbook's going to talk about it. Uh, so we get small material in here. We get bigger material in here. Just know that one of the ways it can do it is uh, non mediated th through receptors, and the other one is mediated through receptors. Um, through these processes, we get an endosome, right? So we get the, basically the same thing here. They're both endosomes and they bring in material or products for the cell to use. Um, uh, these things can also inter interact with lysosomes and lysosomes essentially do the same thing, but these have digestive enzymes in it. So this is going to take the cargo and break it down and use it somehow, right? And most of the time it's going to be through, um, as I said before, nutrient uptake, especially for this class. So we're sorting and delivering nutrients and delivering those nutrients through throughout the cell. And then we have phagocytosis, which is different through from endocytosis because this one is going to be to be focusing more on getting rid of things that are harmful harmful to the cell so it's going to start getting rid of um, the cell is trying to destroy something like a virus or an infected part of the cell okay so these are often as I said immune cells and I told you that macrophages phagocytes and neutrophils these are all 
immune cells and they're going to help to try to get rid of some dangerous things that might hurt the cell. Um, and we're not going to talk about transcytosis. You guys could figure that out. Something is brought in and it's basically taken across the cell and then leaves through exocytosis, right? So this is a way of, think of this as just a tunnel, right? If you're in a train, let's say you're in New Jersey um, and you, you're in a car and you want to get to uh, Manhattan, well, you're going to go under the bridge, right? Under the Hudson River and that will get you to Manhattan. So that's what transcytosis does. It takes, it takes material, passes it through the cell. Nothing's being graded. Nothing's being left behind. Nothing's being utilized. And it's just spitting it out through exocytosis on the other side of the cell. So if we think of this being a cell here, um, then we, oh, sorry about that. We can think of what happened. Give me one second. Let me go back here. Okay. We can think of this as interstitial space, which means that another cell might be right here on the bottom, right? So this could just be passing material along to another cell. And that's, that's basically how receptors and endosomes, uh, work together. All right. Now, there are, let me see if it's here. No, it's not there. I'm going to be long-winded here. Like I told you, there are diseases that are associated with endocytosis and they call it endosomal dysfunction. Now, this might not be in your book. I don't remember seeing it there. Uh, so you do need to take notes on this. Um, and if you want, I can actually put this on a slide. Uh, so you guys have this, uh, I'll just have to type it out and get it to you guys. So, um, Endosomal dysfunction is associated with many, many health conditions. Okay, so something goes wrong here. Something goes wrong here. Let's say that the endosome is not passing off material to the lysosome. So, for example, patients with very, very high levels of cholesterol, which we call hypercholesterolemia, um, they display high, high blood uh, cholesterol levels. Uh, these can eventually lead to heart attack. Uh, one of the one of the mechanisms involved in hypercholesterolemia is this dysfunction, right? So, like I said before, if something happens on a cellular level, it will have consequences on a tissue level, on an organ level, and systemic um, complications. So, let's say this is let's say this endosomes is not they're not functioning right in some other tissue in the body. Well, this is going to have an impact on the heart. So eventually this dysfunction will make its way back to the heart um, and the heart will start to deal with issues. So um, we know that high blood cholesterol is due to the inability to uptake low density lipids by the cells, right? So you guys know that low density lipids or low density lipoproteins are strongly associated with um, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So there are mutations that can occur on the low density lipoprotein receptor. And this is responsible for impaired endosol, uh, endocytosis processes, right? So let's just say this is an LDL receptor, right? And LDL has to bind to these receptors, right? And let's just say this is in the liver because the liver is packed very tightly with LDL, HDL and VLDL receptors. So if there is a complication here, and the um, LDL is binding here, and it's because this is mutated, we don't get the formation of the LDL, or I'm sorry, of the endosome. And then the endosome cannot make its way into the cell to be broken down and digested, which means now the LDL, let's say this is the bloodstream up here, it's just going to be circulating, and then other tissues are going to take it up, and then we're going to lead to an issue called hypercholesterolemia, right? So um, keep that in mind. If this is impaired, it's let's say, and we know that receptors are made at a level of DNA, right? So when you're, when a gene needs to express a new scepter, receptor, uh, the DNA will make it and then it will translocate it to the surface where it will be embedded in the cell. So if there's a mutation in the receptor, that means that if we had a strand of DNA down here, that means there would be a mutation somewhere in the gene that expresses this protein sequence in this in this receptor okay so um this can lead to so something on the cellular level can lead to high levels of circulating cholesterol which then then lead to myocardial infarction or um 
um, apoptosis of cardiomyocytes and it can lead to coronary artery disease. Um, so this is a way to show you guys that if this doesn't work, it's going to have mutations, it's going to have implications on other parts. Um, so, and with the, interestingly, with diseases uh, associated with LDL receptor mutation, um, one of the mutations that occurs prevents the coated pit, the clathrin coated pits from forming. So that's why I keep pointing this out to you, this clathrin, these are proteins called clathrin coated pits. So it's C-L-A-T-H-R-I-N. So this mutation impacts how LDL binds to the receptor. Then the signal that sends is sent down from the receptor to the clathrin coated pits is, um, it's, it's dysregulated. It doesn't work. The message, think back to the phone lines, that message doesn't get received. That means the LDL doesn't get taken in by the vesicles. It doesn't be, it's not handed off to the lysosomes and it's not degraded to be used by the cell, which means it just starts floating in the bloodstream. And we are then starting to kind of move our way towards heart attacks and, um, issues with the heart. So, um, yeah, so that's one of the ways in another one that if I can remember correctly, another one is patients with Alzheimer's disease. They also have endos, uh, endosomal dysfunction that is associated with, uh, the neurogenerative, nor neurodegenerative characters, um, associated with amyloid plaque building and, uh, toxic beta amyloid peptides building in the brain. So, um, it, if my memory serves me right, those are two diseases that can be initiated and exacerbated by something as small as a receptor on the surface of a membrane, right? So, so there you go. Um, so make sure you guys took notes on that, especially the LDL and the receptors. And that's why I left this here. And, uh, let's finally, let's finally move on. So, um, just to kind of reinforce that now I have a picture here of a cell receptor. Um, you can see the receptor, you can see the ligand, here is the uh, membrane. And what I just mentioned to you guys before about the LDL and the, um, the dysregulation of the clathrin coated pits, um, this is the word I want you to basically remember now is if there is a problem here and the receptor cannot recognize the ligand, or let's say it does recognize the ligand, but let's say somewhere in here, the amino acid sequence has been mutate, mutated by the DNA, right? Because we know that even though this just looks like a, uh, just, just a figure, right? We know that this is really made up of amino acids, right? Because this is a protein that was built down here, right? So it was initially built down here, and maybe one of the exons that is a gene for this receptor. Maybe it was mutated. And when that was mutated, it sent up a, a bad receptor, right? And now the receptor recognizes LDL, but it cannot properly initiate a signal transduction, transduction. And that signal transduction is what starts here and goes down here. So, and if we want to kind of, if we want to kind of review what that was, let me just, uh, let me find that slide for you guys. Give me one second. I got to put the, there it is right here, right? This horrific thing was all about signal transductions. So we can see the receptor, it receives a ligand and then that signal from the ligand binding to the receptor gets, gets, there's a transduction all the way down to the DNA and it tells the cell to do something. Right. So when we have a mutation on a gene and then that mutation is going to impact the cell receptor, uh, that's going to impact signal transduction. Right. Um, so these are also known as cell surface receptors or transmembrane receptors. There's, there's a couple of words for them. And these are proteins that bind to signaling molecules. And that's what a ligand is. Ligands are signaling molecules. Uh, these receptors span the plasma membrane, as I showed you in that other picture. So if you just want me to kind of remind you, let me go back because this is a lot of information. So, you know, these are, these are kind of representing, um, transmembrane protein receptors, right? Dot, 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 right? So they, they, they're, they basically encompass or they're embedded in the membrane that encompasses every single cell, right? Most important, uh, protein in cell function is the receptor. Um, it's, it, it's, so it's involved in this signal transduction in which the extracellular signal is converted into an intracellular signal. All right. So remember that 
this signal has to bind to this in an order for the cell to understand what it is and how to process it. And in the case of that LDL receptor, it says, oh, this is low density lipoproteins. I know this is going to have a lot of cholesterol. It's going to have a lot of triglycerols. It's going to have very little protein. So let's process this. Let's take it in through an endosome. Let's hand it off to the lysosome. Let's break it up and let's distribute its contents within the cell so we can use it. And how are they going to use it? Well, maybe that cholesterol is going to be put back in here into the membrane. Because if you look here, cholesterol is an important part of the membrane. So are triglycerides, right? So are phospholipids. So all the fats that are taken in through the LDL receptor and through the endosome, they're going to get put back into this to help fortify the, um, the, the lipid bilayer. So it, it's very useful and precious cargo. Um, so... You know, cell surface receptor proteins are, are fundamental to normal cellular function and everything living, everything that we do on a daily basis, those those receptors are being used in real time uh, throughout the day. So it, it should come to no surprise that a malfunction in any of these proteins can have severe consequences on not only the cell, but again, repeat myself because it's like a song. The more you hear it, you're going to memorize it more. Uh, trust me, I don't want to repeat this over and over again because my voice is starting to get hoarse, but I'm trying to help you out. Uh, if it happens at the cell, it will happen at the tissue, it will happen at the organ, and then it will basically uh, flood out into other tissues and start to cause complications there. So any error in the protein structure, right? This is a protein structure. Any mistake there, um, then these receptor mount, these receptors um, have been shown to play uh, – or they just have a very strong association with diseases. So if there's any error in this amino acid sequence or any error in its ability to bind or recognize a ligand or any mistake or error uh, in its ability to send down a signal transduction, these mistakes are associated with, and I'm talking about very serious diseases, hypertension, uh, heart disease, cancer, asthma. Those are all diseases that can start from just one receptor not doing what it should be doing. So in disease states, um, many of these receptors can alter their number. Okay. So let's just say this is a, let's just say this is a inflammatory receptor. All right. And when we're young and healthy, these inflammatory receptors are uh, far and few between, right? Because we'll get chronic inflammation and we'll be fine. We'll be totally okay. As we get older or we, as we start to move into a disease state, what might happen is that these inflammatory receptors, uh, they might to start doubling, doubling in population. So we'll have one here. Uh, I could draw. I could make this even better for you. Let me just do this I'll because I like to draw. Uh, do I have a blue? Nope. I'll take, uh, let's, let's make it blue. Uh, that's pretty close. So what happens in a disease state, get this out of here is we'll just start putting up more, right? And where will that come from? Well, it will come from the DNA because what's going to produce these receptors? Well, if we got a lot of inflammation here, right? And it's, you know, it's cytokines, you know, circulating in the blood and they're, they're constantly bombarding the receptors. Well, that receptor is going to say, Hey, DNA, let's come down here. We got a lot of inflammation. So, um, we can't handle all of these these cytokines here. Can you send up some more receptors? And the DNA is like, yeah, I, I gotcha. You know, the, the, the cell doesn't know it's in trouble. So it will start sending up more of these receptors. And that's how we start to develop chronic inflammation or diseases that are associated with chronic inflammation. So this is how this, is how this works. Now, what we've seen with a lot of these receptors that are... Um, associated with the development of a disease, if we start to exercise, we get these things called metallic metalloproteases and they act like lawnmowers and they come over here and they say, nope, not today. And they cut it up and they say, nope, not today. They basically go along the surface of the cell and they just start chopping up these receptors to get rid of them. And what happens if you start chopping up these receptors? Well, that signal transduction 
can't happen anymore. So when we exercise, we they're called MMP, metalla. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, head but metalloproteases. Um, they're they're basically lawnmowers that go along this, the the receptor uh, the membrane here, and they just start chopping up uh, where the ligand binds to the receptor. So again, exercise is medicine, right? It's a beautiful thing. Um, let me erase this and let me talk a little bit more. This is another one of those long winded ones. So I apologize. Um, there we go. All my beautiful artwork is gone. Okay. So, um, another thing that happens in disease states is we can have, um, like I said, we can alter the number, right? We can alter the number of receptors. And if we increase the number, then that means the signal is stronger. If we decrease the number, that means the signal is weaker. And in the case of a disease, which would we rather have a stronger signal that is going to exacerbate the disease or a weaker signal that's going to maybe reduce or suppress the progression of the disease. Obviously we want the, the weaker signal, but, but you can't always, um, we can't always say that less is better. Okay. Because if we start losing receptors, there's some diseases that are associated with not having enough receptors. Okay. So, um, basically we can have a loss of receptors, which means we will have a loss of function. Um, there are diseases associated with uh, autoimmune disorders in which antibodies destroy certain receptors in skeletal muscle. Um, and basically some of these receptors help to signal, uh, muscle contraction. So if we have a, um, autoimmune disorder and we start breaking down some of these receptors and these receptors somehow play a role in muscle contraction. Well, then what happens to muscle contraction? We, we, we start to lose the ability of, um, having muscle contraction and the muscles tend to get weak. We tend to get droopy eyes in certain conditions. And even in other conditions, we, they, we have issues with swallowing, um, because swallowing is a, what makes you swallow muscles, right? And just to make that description a bit more official, um, I added this down here. So one of those, that disease I was referring to is, is also called myasthenia gravis, right? So um, this disease is associated with weakening muscles and um, you're going to have a hard time swallowing. You're going to have a droopy eyes is another thing that's associated with it, right? Because the muscle obviously keeps our eyes um, and our skin and everything. Uh, you know, we can, we're able to blink and, and move those uh, things because of muscle contraction. So um, with this particular disease, we have immune res or immune response or an uh, autoimmune response where our own uh, white blood cells or antibodies um, destroy this receptor, which is also called, I have it here as NACHR, um, but it's nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And this is a receptor that helps um, helps with muscle contraction, right? Um, or, or propagate a signal that helps with muscle contraction. So what happens is when we have uh, these antibodies coming around and uh, our autoimmune system is destroying these nicotinic um, receptors, acetylcholine receptors, then we start to lose the transduction of that signal that is assisting with muscle contraction. And now we have no, or we have weakness of contraction. We have weak muscles um, and we have other dysfunctions associated with it. So that would be an example of loss of receptors. So now let me erase that. And let me see if I can just kind of do this in real time. Um, there we go. Um, so we now we talked about losing receptors and how losing receptors can lead to problems. Now, what happens if we start gaining receptors? And one of the things that we see in numerous conditions associated with type two diabetes is a gain of function because of receptors. So the first example, this one here was a loss of function. We lose the ability to, um, conduct proper, strong muscle contractions. And then with the example from type two diabetes, we are going to, um, lose, I'm sorry, we're going to gain function. I'm trying to multitask here and turn off my eraser. Okay. So let me move this out of the way and I'm just going to do it in real time. Um, so, uh, in type two diabetes, um, we have a lot of gain of function mutations, and this results 
in some cases in an in increased expression in adrenergic receptors. So there is a type of receptor, and I think I put it up here. Let me see if I can, let me see if I have it there. Um, one second. Where did I put it? Hold on. Here it is. Okay. I think it's here. Right here. You see that? It says CPCR. I'm sorry, G. That's a G protein coupled receptor. So this is a receptor uh, that goes through the membrane six or seven times. Um, you, you don't need to worry about that. I'm just showing you that what we're talking about here is, um, is used quite a bit in, in research and, and not. Um, so what happens with this uh adrenergic receptor is that um, when we get more of these receptors, it prevents or suppresses the secretion of insulin, uh, specifically in um, the pancreas, right? So one of the things that happens with type 2 diabetes is we get um, loss of both insulin secretion and loss of uh, insulin sensitivity at other tissues. So um, when we have an upregulation of these type of receptors, it impacts our ability to secrete. Let me just type that for you as well. So let me see if I can just type it earlier. Let me see if I can put it in here for you if it makes sense. Oh, that's so big. Sorry about that. Let me see if it will shrink. It is so unprofessional doing this in real time, but I just want you guys to have as much information as I can give you. Um, there we go. That's that's okay. I can live with that. Um, so when we get, well, let's draw, when we get more of these G coupled protein receptors, right? Do, do, do. I'm just drawing this because they go through the membrane a couple of times, right? This is how they actually really look. Okay. When we start to get more of them, this is a gain of function, right? And when we have this gain of function with these, um, with these proteins or these receptors, then we start to lose or we suppress the secretion of insulin in the beta cells in the pancreas. Um, so I'm not going to ask you anything about these receptors. I'm just telling you the concepts, right? This is all conceptual. So you guys should be saying, okay, that was a lot of information, but basically what he's saying is that we can lose these or we can gain these in a disease state in a healthy condition their presence is regulated and we don't really lose them we don't gain them but we do turn them over which means when a protein gets old or decrepit give me a second here let's go back to something because this is where i can tie lessons together uh, it's like a quentin tarantino movie like there's just important pieces that come out of order um, but it's important how do we know that a cell is getting older? Well, because the telomeres begin to shorten and they start to get tattered and that represents cellular senescence. So when the telomeres are starting to get short, that means it's time to put the cell down and make new cells or, or in this case, a protein. We're going to put the protein down. We're going to have protein turnover. So um, where did that slide go? So in a normal state, these get turned over, which means once they start getting a little decrepit, we're going to put new ones in there, right? It's like you guys in shoes, you know, you, you, if you have a pair of shoes for about a year and they just don't support you anymore, let's get rid of them and get some new shoes. So that's maintenance. That's cellular maintenance. It happens all the time. But in a disease condition, we can get more of these and that can be uh, problematic. Um, or we can get less of these and that could be problematic and just know that more is gain of function and know that less is loss of function. And we have diseases where we have a loss of function and that impacts something as simple as muscle contraction. We have type two diabetes where we gain more of these, uh, receptors and they somehow, uh, they have implications on insulin secretion. So that's how that works. Uh, we also have issues where these coded pits aren't formed because there could be a mutation here. So, so we can even have mutations in the receptor, right? So we could have a gain, a loss, or just simply mutations. And that is going to impact what signal transductions that happen 
downstream of the receptor. So whenever in science we say downstream, that means if I say downstream from this receptor, the first thing you guys should do is be like, oh, he, he wants me to look down, right? If I say this here, I say, okay, guys, look at this early endosome here. Now let's look upstream at the receptor. You'll go, oh, upstream. Okay, let's look up here. That's what upstream and downstream means when we're talking about signal transductions. Okay, so that is um, what we have on that. And then I have this here as well. Uh, this is an example of what happens um, in type 2 diabetes. So under normal condition, uh, this is looking at insulin. So now insulin is another type of receptor, right? So I told you that in the last slide, we can have a gain of function with those G-coupled protein receptors. And that gain of function can impact how much insulin is secreted in the blood. But I also said we can have issues at the tissue that is receiving insulin. So this is looking at what happens at the tissue. So this is, uh, let me just orient you, this is the cellular membrane, right? This is the tran this is the receptor that is transmembrane. It is going through the membrane of the um, of the lipid bilayer here. This is a ligand, right? And since we're talking about diabetes and insulin, we can assume that this ligand here is insulin and it's going to bind to the insulin receptor IR. Now the insulin receptor has an alpha subunit, which is these two blue things, and it has a beta subunit, which are these two here. And when insulin binds to an insulin receptor, this beta unit undergoes something called autophosphorylation or, uh, yeah. So, and you don't need to know all this. I'm just, I'm just walking you through this so you can see how this receptor does its signal transduction. Now, IRS1, IRS here, these two proteins or these two propagation proteins, right? They're going to say, oh, there's a signal coming. Here's the signal. I'm going to send this signal down to, here's the DNA, here's the nucleus, right? These, these proteins here, they won't recognize that insulin has bound until this part of the receptor starts to get phosphates on it. And that's why they call it autophosphorylation because once it binds, phosphates start popping up on the bottom and then these guys go oh there's the bat signal there's the phosphate let's let's move over to the receptor and start communicating with these other proteins all right um so when it binds it autophosphorylates and that's the bat signal that starts to recruit irs1 irs1 needs to be phosphorylated so this guy this phosphate has to be put on to this guy right so now we have phosphates which are helping with signal transduction now under the condition of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and inflammation uh, this is um, this doesn't work sometimes so sometimes this will bind and this won't turn on the bat signal won't turn on and if the bat signal doesn't come on these guys don't come over and basically insulin will bind and nothing happens and if nothing happens what happens to sugar the sugar can't get into the cell so we can have issues on um the the uh, insulin receptor now remember what i told you guys um what happens in one tissue is going to impact what happens in another tissue so on that previous slide I was saying here that these G-coupled protein receptors, when they're upregulated into the pancreatic uh, cell membrane, uh, they suppress insulin. So now we have less insulin being secreted. And then we can also have, when type 2 diabetes, we can have impairment of the insulin receptor, which means the very little insulin that has been secreted because of the problem at the pancreas is now having problems here. So now insulin is basically not doing anything anything it should be doing all right and um now basically we start to divide we start to develop high blood sugar because the insulin is not letting the sugar into the cell and if we have high blood sugar well that's going to change the blood that's going to change the ph of the blood that's going to start damaging the kidney that's going to start damaging the neurons that's going to start damaging the retinas in your eyes that's going to start dam damaging your blood vessels that's why people who have severe type 2 diabetes they have to get uh, limbs cut off because there's so much ischemia and so much damaged blood vessels in the lower appendages that oxygen can't get there so you start to have um, necrosis of skeletal muscle down there because it's not getting oxygen so so you see how these little things can lead to blindness 
They can lead to kidney dysfunction. They can lead to heart attacks. They could lead to dyslipidemia, which will further exacerbate heart attacks. So these little cellular things will have massive consequences. And that's all I want to show you on that. And again, you don't need to know all this. Just say, okay, he said that this binds to this. If there's a problem, the bat signal doesn't turn on. And if the bat signal doesn't turn on, these phosphates can't be tagged onto IRS. And in, in type 2 or in, in um, sugar uptake and glucose uptake, if it's successful, this phosphate will be put here. This guy will also bind to P85 and P10, which are scaffolding proteins that work with this IRS. They will activate PIP2, which will activate PIP3. You see that there? This will activate PDK, and it, this will then phosphorylate AKT. And then these AKT will basically send those uh, GLUT4 vesicles up to the membrane to help bring sugar into the cell. So you see how intricate this is, and you see how something so little can cause such a catastrophe. Um, so yeah, that's all I got for you on that one. Let's move on to the next one. So we just spent a lot of time talking about cell surface receptors. Um, and now we're going to talk about internal receptors. Um, you guys, you guys know what these are. We've talked about them in muscle, in exercise biochemistry. We've talked about them in exercise physiology. You probably talked about them in physiology, but let's just kind of go over a basic uh, description of them and talk about what kind of diseases are associated with changes in internal receptors. Um, I have two pictures here that will kind of help depict all this, um, and we're going to move through this one kind of quickly. Um, and, um, yeah, let's talk about this. So these are also known as intracellular or cytosolic receptors. Okay. So here we have the plasma membrane here. We have the cytoplasm, right here. We have the signaling molecule and notice that there's no receptor here, right? So this ligand has the ability to move through the plasma membrane and it will bind in with an intracellular receptor. So we can imagine that this might be utilized through something called endocytosis, right? Or an endosome might bring it in. Uh, so we're kind of going back to what we talked about before. Um, as I said, it's found in the cytoplasm of, of target cells. Um, so this image here would represent the target cell that this signaling molecule is targeting. I'm trying to introduce new language to you as well. And once this guy gets inside the cell, um, many of these molecules can bind to proteins that act as regulators of DNA transcription and mRNA synthesis, right? To mediate gene expression. So a lot of these internal receptors are, um, activate gene expression. So we have this here. Uh, we have the, the ligand. So the ligand will get into the cell. It will cross the membrane. It will bind to the receptor. And then this receptor will translocate, right? That's the word we use through the membrane of the nuclei. And uh, it will then bind to DNA and we will have some gene activation, right? So those genes will loosen up a little bit. Um, they will expose their intra their exons and uh, the introns, which have the promoter sequence and the important landing information, right? It tells the DNA polymerase where to land. Uh, they will expose themselves, the, the unwrap themselves around the histone and expose themselves so that we can begin some type of translation and transcription, right? Um, and then basically when the ligand binds to this um, an internal receptor is when it's dormant it is in one shape all right it's it's inactive because uh it doesn't want to be activated by something that shouldn't activate it okay so let's think of a let's think of a transformer right so you guys all seen the movie transformers right um it wants to hide itself from humanity. So it's going to transform into a unicycle, all right, or a moped, right? And people walking by, they're just like, oh, it's just a regular moped or that's, look at that, it's a unicycle, right? They pay no attention to it. But once a ligand comes in and it binds to that moped or that unicycle, it's going to transform. So it's going to change its shape, all right? We call that process a conformational shape or a conformational change. 
it changes its shape and that way um, it is active and that process is is essentially an example of regulation when it's when it's a transformer right when it's like when it's a moped and nobody pays attention to it uh, no other molecules can bind to it but when this one binds to it it will change its shape just like an enzyme and uh, once it changes its shape it, it does so in a, in a way that nothing else can bind to it and it it has its instructions to move into the nucleus so that's why we have these conformational changes um, and then um, it wants to bind to the DNA. So the, this is called a ligand receptor complex right here. And this complex moves into the nucleus, binds to a specific regulatory region of the DNA, and it promotes the initiation of transcription and translation. And let's look at another one. Oh, that's so blurry. My goodness. I got to see if I can, let me see if I can fix that. That's awful. Does that help at all? A little bit. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was a good picture too. I'm having such a tough time with technology right now, guys. I'm like this just, I don't know what's going on. Um, so steroid hormones are one of the major ligands that use internal receptors. All right. Um, so we get uh, steroid hormones, which are in the blood. Uh, generally, they have to have protein carriers because steroid hormones have a lot of components of uh, fat and uh, cholesterol, so they need proteins to help get them where they need to be. Uh, they can get inside the cell. Uh, they will bind to a receptor, right? We have this complex here, and then that receptor will go into the DNA, it will bind, and then um, we will get uh, transcription and translation, so it activates the genes. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of show you another picture of that. Um, here is an example. Let me just kind of go here. You guys, I'm sure you guys know this, but steroid hormone receptors and steroid hormones. Uh, obviously, uh, this is steroid hormone receptor. We have sex hormone receptors and we have adrenal hormone receptors. That These are just examples. So you're like, oh, these are the things that use the internal receptors. Uh, you guys are very aware of, oh, let me make this bigger here. Sorry. Um, you guys are very aware of what estrogen and progesterone are. Um, when we talk about the adrenal glands uh, or the adrenal receptors, these are things that are going to bind to, oh, geez, what is going on here? Sorry, I'm, I'm getting like weird things happening with the computer. Anyways, these receptors are going to bind things that are um, come from the adrenal glands, right? So these are going to be cortisol, uh, aldosterone, epinephrine, um, things like that. So um, basically these internal receptors, right? Let me go back here. These, oh my gosh, why is that so big? I'm really starting to hate technology. I don't know if I, I'm disliking it per se, but I, just having to rely on it so much because of this modality of teaching, it's incredibly frustrating. And yeah, just had to get that out there. All right, let me make this bigger again. I am sorry. Um, Okay, here we go. So what about dysfunction now in these types of receptors? So again, don't worry about estrogen, progesterone, cortisol. Don't, don't worry about that because all of those are their own unique sciences. We could spend months talking about how receptors bind to estrogen and estrogen binds to receptors. We could literally talk the entire semester about it. Just understand the concepts. Steroid hormones like to use internal receptors internal receptors they're dormant they're in one shape and once the ligand binds whether it's cortisol whatever it is testosterone uh growth factor whatever it is it's going to go through a conformational change it's going to change its shape why is it doing that so it can be regulated so that way this receptor and and the cell can say we only want a certain amount of this product and to make sure we only get a certain amount, we're going to keep this thing closed and nothing else can bind to it. Nothing else can activate it except for this one particular thing. Now, um, there are complications that can arise from this receptor that will lead to other issues in the body. So um, there are basically two main ways um, steroid receptors can be defected. So we can have disruption in the physiolo physiological function of these receptors, which leads to types of malignancies such as 
uh, breast cancer and uh, leukemia and lymphoma. Uh, I think prostate cancer is also associated with changes in uh, these type of receptors. Uh, I believe ovarian cancer is also associated with that, especially if we're dealing with estrogen and progesterone, right? Those obviously are going to have uh, implications on um, the the f anatomy of uh, females' reproduction organs, lung cancer. These things are all related to these changes. So steroid receptors, oh my goodness, steroid, res what just happened here? Here we go. Um I mentioned Coors Light to you guys earlier. I think I might need to go grab like a 24 pack or something. And I don't even drink, but that's how I'm starting to feel right now. Um, dire, dire consequences if uh, any of these things go wrong. Um, if we go back to cell receptors, right? Um, some of the things that can be associated with cell re receptor dysfunction um, it doesn't have to just be mutations, but things like viruses. Uh, HIV, um, these things, influenza, these things like to bind to certain receptors and activate them, right? So yes, we can have issues with the DNA. Yes, we can have issues with the protein. Yes, we can have issues with uh, this receptor, right? So we can have mutations in this receptor. We can have mutations in the gene that produces this receptor. We could also have viruses and um, flu uh, bacteria, not bacteria, mostly viruses, uh, binding to these receptors. So these things are highly highly susceptible to, to damage. Um, uh, estrogen receptors, there's a lot of research out there that show how estrogen receptors specifically um, are related to lots of different cancers um, and uh, fibrosis and cardiovascular disease. So modulations in these receptors, if we're just talking about estrogen, have a massive implication on uh, pretty serious diseases such as cancer. So um, that's another one that you can kind of think of like the compare and contrast, like, okay, the cellular receptors, um, you know, they're more susceptible to like viruses binding to them. HIV uses a cellular receptor to do what it needs to do. I think that receptor is called CCR5 too. Um, I think that's the name of it, but it doesn't matter. I'm just talking out loud. Um, and then the steroid receptors, they're more, they have heavier implications in the development of cancer. Um, so we talked about about that. Um, here is a, another example of a cellular transduction pathway. Um, and we can just kind of talk about this for a moment, nothing to, to get scared of here. Um, so this is a steroid signal activation and intracellular localization of sex steroid receptors. So here are the ligands. Right, so if it's estrogen, testosterone, or progesterone, uh, these are the ligands. They get inside the cell and they bind to the receptor. They bind to the receptor. They bind to the receptor, and then they have a transduction response. Right, so they start to communicate with these other proteins. We you don't need to know these. If you guys were doing PhDs, you would need to know every single one of these and what they do. And basically. Uh, they activate the gene. So I'm just trying to show you a bigger picture now. So um, these uh, these receptors are very, very powerful. And what they do is they, they basically impact every tissue in the body. I think even the, no, I don't think I know, even the central nervous system is impacted by steroid receptors. Um, and uh, again, Estrogens, androgens, progesterones, uh, cortisol—these things are all uh, going to interact with these type of um, these type of receptors. And I just wanted to kind of show you how this works, right? Because I showed you. Um, let me go back down. I did show you a cell receptor, right? Or cell surface receptor, right? So this one is in the membrane. Now I just and I showed you like the full complete picture. Now I just want to kind of go here and show you that okay, this is different because they're not interacting on the surface. They're interacting here. Once they turn on, you guys know that they they change their shape. Once they change their shape, they're active and they can communicate with other proteins in the cell, ERK CR3. Uh, then they can translocate into the uh, DNA. And you can see here, the receptor is in the DNA. It is interacting with the architecture of the DNA. So that is another major difference between a cell surface receptor and 
a uh, um, internal receptor or a steroid receptor. Um, so yeah, those are the major differences. That's all I got on that. Let's move on. Okay. So another one I wanted to talk to you guys about today was growth factors. Um, this is another really potent signal with cancer. And since I just kind of mentioned that on the last slide, and we were talking about the internal receptors and how strongly, strongly associated they are with cancer, I thought I would also call it, talk about growth factors as well. So growth factors are generally uh, obviously, they're going to make the cells grow. They're going to make the cells divide. They're going to ensure communication between other cells so that um, they work together in unison to grow and divide together. So growth factors are a really, really strong signal that has to do with cell division, cell building, cell growth. Um, they off they often promote cell differentiation and maturation as well right so let's differentiate and make more cells um and this will vary between growth factor signals so just think of growth factors as saying okay let's get bigger let's replicate let's divide let's create more why might something like that be associated with cancer i'm going to just kind of be quiet for a little bit and let you guys think about that if if you're getting a signal to say grow divide, grow, divide, differentiate, grow, divide. Uh, well, that's what happens with tumors. And that's what happens with metastasism. And that's what happens with cancer spreading. So growth factors is uh, another really potent signal that is um, a, a major contributor to many, many different cancers. So, so this is the most important part here is inappropriate growth control is a defining feature of human cancer. Um, and then we get excess cytokine responses, which are inflammatory, uh, which make it all worse. Uh, diabetes is also associated with that as well. So um, let's just kind of look at this here. So growth factors, different than what we saw with the steroid hormones, this one uses a, what kind of receptor is this? This is the membrane, right? This receptor is going through the membrane, so it's a transmembrane receptor uh, or a cell surface receptor, the same thing. Um, normally cells do not divide unless they are stimulated by signals from other cells, which is this growth factor molecule, right? So this growth factor, well, let's just, let's just imagine for a moment here that let's get, uh, this guy here are the growth factor signals, right? They're kind of circulating on the outside of the cell and they want to bind right there. And when they bind there, we have signal transduction. And now the cell knows that it is time to do something associated with growing or dividing or building okay um, they promote cell growth they bind to the surface of the receptors um, and these receptors are linked to a tyrosine kinase what is a kinase it is an enzyme um, and this enzyme will basically once it's turned on it will activate all these other signals right ROS, RAF, MEC, ERK uh, PI3K, AKT, mTOR. You guys are you guys that lift weights know that mTOR is a big one with what muscle growth. So it only makes sense that cellular growth, since muscles are made of cells, um, mTOR is involved. Uh, these things all begin to communicate with the DNA, and then we have pr proliferation. Right? We have uh, cell growth. But when there are complications, and I don't need to say this over and over again, because you know that they can happen here, they can happen here, they can happen here. Compl complications can happen anywhere down here. Uh, anything downstream of the receptor or the receptor itself, we get uncontrolled growth, which leads to, and then all these things here, right? Cancer, cell survival, differentiation, adhesion. That means cells are binding together. Proliferation, they're getting bigger, metastasizing, they're spreading out. Um, so growth factors is super suit and super potent version of um, a cell signal that can lead to cancer. So again, the takeaway here with all the, the cell receptor stuff is there are components inside the cell that tell the DNA what to do. And in the presence of a, a disease or a disease that is initiating the receptors or the plasma membrane, or uh, the modulators, right? These propagation signaling molecules that are always in the middle, they things can go wrong. And I gave you guys plenty of examples of how things can go wrong and what diseases they lead to. And this is just a, I've given you guys just a sliver. When you guys get into, if you ever want to study pathology and go down that route, you will get into some heavy, heavy, even like if this is a protein here, 
they can tell you, you know, PI3K is a major protein kinase C, major, major protein involved in glucose metabolism. Um, it's, let's say this is made up of 30,000 amino acids, right? Um, molecular biologists can say, wow, the mutation that is occurring on PI3K is the leucine on 355 residue. So that means that the 355th amino acid residue is a leucine, or it should be a leucine. And let's say it's being mutated into a valine. And just because of that one amino acid that's been changed in a mutation that came from DNA, right? It didn't come from the protein. The DNA messed it up. Now there's an issue with signaling propagation. So that's, that's how, that's how sensitive these things are. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is the mitochondria. And I'm not going to talk about what the mitochondria does. You know that we are going to talk about some of the roles of the mitochondria specifically with necrosis and apoptosis and how the mitochondria, when the cells in trouble, the mitochondria will induce or initiate the signals for the cell to destroy itself. So that's what we're going to get into in this section here. We are almost done, I promise you. So just a couple things about the mitochondria. Uh, we'll just basically talk about some of the characteristics. Uh, we're going to go through it really fast because this is, uh, I put this in your reading. You already know this. You've, you've, you're master level students. You've talked about mitochondria a million times. Um, they can, they contain their own DNA, um, just like, uh, every other cell in the body, except the DNA of the mitochondria is circular. Um, they basically encode 20% of the proteins involved in oxidative for phosphorylation, right? So everything involved in using the, um, using the fat and oxygen to help create energy, they, they produce 20% of the necessary enzymes involved in that process uh, in, the, in the mitochondria. Um, it can carry out steps of DNA replication, transcription, and translation, uh, just like normal DNA in other cells. Uh, but sometimes it does need assistance from nucleic DNA, right? So it can't do everything on its own. It can do a lot on its own, but um, it does need help from nucleic DNA to help create some of its enzymes and some of its um, necessary proteins to help the mitochondria function. So we know that in the mitochondria, we have ATP synthesis. We know that when there's issues with the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, we will get free radicals. Free radicals are a major source of... Um, changes that occur in a disease state. So as we talked about cell receptor issues that can, that can um, occur in a disease state, let's just go to this picture since this is our last one, right? We know that we know that the receptors, something can go wrong with the receptors. We know that if there's DNA down here, we can have mutations in DNA, which will basically produce mutations in receptor. Um, all, well, that's the top and the bottom, right? We know the bottom can have problems with gene expression. We can have mutations in gene expression. We can have mutations in receptors and the amino acids that make up the receptors. Now, the stuff in the middle, like uh, PI3K, AKT, mTOR, these are all fair game for modifications by free radicals, right? So ROS, reactive oxidative species. So when we have the presence of a disease that is initiating, we can have a problem here we can have a problem here and then free radicals can pick these things off. So let's say we don't have a problem here, but we have a problem here and we start developing free radicals. Well, uh, the receptor might be fine, but the free radicals will start knocking these guys down and we still have problems in signal transduction. So free radicals are, are, are nasty. They're nasty things and they can, uh, we'll talk about those more in class. Uh, we know that ATP is generated. We know that we have an outer membrane and we have an inner membrane in the mitochondria. Well, if the mitochondria creates its own, has its own DNA and it could create its own protein, well, then obviously it has to have ribosomes because that's where it's going to assemble uh, the proteins from the messenger RNA. All right, so that's, you guys know all that stuff. So let's just kind of get on to the next section here. So main functions. Uh, you guys know all this. I'm going to let you guys kind of look at this. This is a cool one. Mitochondria also plays an important role in anaerobic metabolism. Uh, think about pyruvate, right? So the mitochondria uh, plays a role in determining whether it's going to take pyruvate from glycolysis and take it into the mitochondria to produce energy, 
or if it's not going to take in pyruvate and it's going to send pyruvate to uh, lactate generation, right? So it's it plays a role in determining cell energy and determining if pyruvate is going to go into aerobic metabolism or if it's going to be shuttled into lactic acid via anaerobic metabolism. So that's that's another cool thing. So so think about that. If we have an issue. Uh, with free radicals being generated in glycolysis and it's knocking down enzymes, how is that going to impact the mitochondria's ability to say, okay, we'll take in pyruvate or no, we don't want pyruvate, send it to lactate dehydrogenase. So again, this is one of those things where if one thing goes wrong, everything downstream generally tends to go wrong. So, But what we're going to talk about mostly, and I'm not sure if you guys have seen this anywhere in your studies, is we're going to talk about how the mitochondria is involved in cell death. So we're going to talk about two forms of cell death. One's going to be necrosis and one's going to be apoptosis. Now, mitochondria, when it is undergoing necrosis uh, or cell death, it is going to morphologically change. Okay, So the organelle, the mitochondria itself, is going to change its morphology. And one of the things that happens when we have necrosis, uh, the organelle, the mitochondria, will begin to swell. The membrane of the mitochondria will begin to rupture. And it will start spilling its cellular material into the cytoplasm. And uh, it will begin to basically cause inflammatory signals because the things inside the mitochondria shouldn't be in the cytoplasm, right? And cells, cells kind of do this same thing if we're not thinking about mitochondria, but we're just thinking about the cell as a whole. When a cell undergoes necrosis, it does the same thing. We get this, this swelling of the cell. It gets bigger, right? It undergoes hypertrophy. The membrane can rupture. Uh, the, the contents from within the cell, all those organelles, endosomes, lysosomes, all those things, they spill out into the uh, interstitial space, and then we have an inflammatory response there. Um, now, necrosis is considered to be um, harmful, okay? It's, 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 it's an unplanned and unprogrammed way for the cell to die, where apoptosis is where the cell says, okay, you know what? We've had enough let's let's kill this thing let's get a, let's get new cells in here this thing's not doing so well so necrosis would be uh for lack of better images uh, an unexpected car accident with fatalities um and uh apoptosis would be if i were to give you an analogy it's like okay um you know fluffy our dog is uh 66 years old in in doggy years and he's 15 years old in in uh, human years He's had a good life. Let's let's put him down and let's let's do it humanely and kind of be done with it. So necrosis would be that car accident, and apoptosis would be putting Fluffy down uh, in a very humane way, where uh, the owners are there holding Fluffy until he uh, passes on into the dog park in the sky. Okay, so that's like the best kind of analogy I can give you. So um, this. Uh, these changes are going to occur in the state of a disease as well. And how this works now, if we're going to just kind of talk about necrosis, when a cell uh, receives a, a signal of cell stress, one of the things that happens is um, it will increase its level of intracellular calcium. So, so calcium becomes a major signal in mitochondria induced cell death so let's just kind of focus on the basics here um, again we're just doing an overview and i just want you to know the difference between <clears throat> pardon me how the mitochondria undergoes necrosis and how the mitochondria undergoes apoptosis so i'm going to read this line for line and then we're going to look at some pictures and i'll give you some more details so necrosis occurs when there is an external cellular injury. So a toxin, ischemia, trauma, uh, could be high, high levels of glucose, dyslipidemia, right? Changes in metabolism. Um, these things are going to basically stress the cell and, or, or it could just be old age. Um, they're going to stress the cell and say, okay, we need to be done with this thing. So ultimately, this will result in damages of the mitochondria. And since it's necrosis, it's unplanned and it's unorganized. And this induces the formation of mitochondria permeability, which means things can get in and things can get out. 
And what's going to happen is the mitochondria is going to develop these transition pores in the outer membrane, and pores are what's going to let the permeability take place. Okay, so think of think of these channels that are going to develop in the mitochondria. So these channels are going to develop, and um, it's going to allow the dissipation of the protein or the proton potential, right? So we know that there's a proton potential in the electron transport chain. That proton, um, the hydrogen ions, right? Uh, it's going to help create ATP. It's going to help the electron transport chain uh, move the electrons. It's going to help ADP get turned into ATP. You guys should know that. Um, and then this is going to ultimately cause ATP generation failure, and the cell is going to die. There's a lot of rat poisonings out there that, um, and insecticides that do the same thing. They will disrupt the electron transport chain, and then ultimately the organism, whether it's a rodent or, uh, you know, locusts or what, whatever, um, they're going to perish because if the mitochondria are destroyed, you can't sustain life. So let's just look at this really quick. I have this picture here. Here's the mitochondria, right? We have the outer and the inner membrane area. You can see here that ATP production is going to be stopped, right? That's what that X means. We can see that if there's disruption to the hydrogen ions and there's disruption to the electron transport chain, well, the electrons that are going to be released, they're going to interact with oxygen because we know there's a lot of oxygen here and you're going to create free radicals. So we have two hits. ATP production is going to stop. That's going to that's going to hurt the cell. It's going to hurt the mitochondria. We have ROS production that's going to um, begin to build up. That's going to hurt the cell. It's going to hurt the mitochondria, especially uh, the lipid bilayers. I told you guys earlier that free radicals or reactive oxidative species they love to bind to lipid bilayers and destroy them and open up uh, the cell, uh, or, or in this case the organelle. Um, and then I told you that they're going to develop these channels, right? These channels uh, which will impact the permeability of the mitochondria. So there's going to be some morphological changes with the mitochondria. And what is going to happen is when this cell receives stress, it's going to increase, it's going to lead to the increase levels of intracellular calcium. Okay, so the mitochondria is going to basically open these channels and calcium is going to rush into the mitochondria. All right. So these channels, um, they're called mitochondria calcium uniporters or MCU, as you can see right here, mitochondrial calcium uniporters. And they're going to take up calcium into the matrix. Here's the mitochondria matrix. You guys should know that. And it's going to trigger the opening of mitochondria permeability transition pores, which are also called MPTP. So more, more pores are going to open up, and I don't think this picture has uh, that particular pore in it. Um, so, But that's okay. Just understand that calcium is going to rush in. Uh, it's going to use this uh, mitochondria calcium uniporter, and then when calcium gets in, another channel is going to open up. So now when there is prolonged opening of this MPTP, right, this mitochondria, I'm going to say it slowly, mitochondria permeability transition pore, um, this is going to result in changes, morphological changes in the cell. So one of the things that's going to happen when calcium rushes in and these two, port these two ports are open, right, the MCU port, which is right here, and I'll say that again just in case you're taking notes, this is called the mitochondria calcium uniporter. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll throw these up. I'll throw these up. These will pop up, so I don't have to sit there and spell them. Uh, and then what I'm going to do here? Let me just let me do one more thing here, so I can make this easier for you guys. Because you know, when I'm reading research and I'm reading your textbooks and I'm you know always reading, I, I forget sometimes what is on um, the slides. So let's just say that. Let me draw what color, let's just say that is this color. Uh, this will be, and this will be, and we'll put one more here. We'll just say that these are, let me, let me draw this for you guys here. This is the M, P, T, P. And of course it's in white, so I'm going to have to, Make that in black for you guys. 
This is the MTP, NPTP, and again, that's the mitochondria permeability transition port. And there's a couple of them in here. I just drew them so that you can visually see them for, for uh, your own sake. Uh, once these are these mitochondria um, permeability transition pores are open for prolonged periods of time, we are going to have some changes in the morphology of the mitochondria. We're going to have osmotic alterations to the mitochondria. So water is going to flood into the cell. Uh, we know that the cytoplasm is filled with lots of water and aqueous solutions. And that is going to essentially cause the mitochondria to swell. And as it swells, it's going to experience uh, dysfunctions in the electron transport chain, which we'll just say is here, right? Uh, once we have dysfunctions there, we're going to lose that proton gradient. So we're not going to be able to produce ATP. ATP is going to be lost. ADP is going to start um, building up, and we can't replace ADP with ATP. And uh, we're going to get reactive oxidative species, which can be super dangerous to everything else in the cell. And then eventually the reactive oxidative species and the swelling because of the change in the osmotic uh, condition of the cell, the mitochondria is going to burst and everything inside is going to essentially uh, leave the mitochondria and go into the cytosol of the cell. So uh, this is dangerous. This is, da this is really dangerous. Loss of ATP un unexpectedly is dangerous to, to the cell. So this is what happens with necrosis. We're kind of having these things occur that uh, are going to make the cell more stressed. And there's, there's pictures there for you guys. Now, if we talk about apoptosis, this is programmed cell death. This entire process is regulated, so we won't have that catastrophe I showed you on the last slide where we have the calcium flooding the cell, which is going to... I'm gonna, not sure I understand. I'm talking to you. Sorry, Siri. Um, calcium flooding the cell. Uh, we're not going to have the the changes in osmotic pressure that's going to release that's going to result in changes in the electron transport chain which is going to cause changes in atp production none of those things are going to happen so um, this process of apoptosis this happens all the time this is normal this is a part of protein regeneration it's about it's a part of tissue regeneration um, this is a part of maintenance right maintenance and protein turnover so this is always happening where ne where necrosis is, is truly undesirable. Um, and then this process can also be activated by extrinsic factors, uh, inflammation and cytotoxic T cells. If we just fo fo focus on inflammation, that can help with signaling apoptosis. And if there's DNA damage and cell stress, well, then the cell is going to want to get rid of itself in an organized fashion. Why? This is the big question. In apoptosis, if there's DNA damage and the cell can say, okay, let's contain this, let's get rid of the cell. Well, because if it can do that, then the DNA damage or the mutation in the DNA isn't going to start causing mutated proteins. So we're not going to get the receptor mutations. We're not going to get the um, mutations in any of the other proteins that are um, propagation proteins, right? So this is a way to say we recognize something is wrong. And let's uh, let's get rid of it before there's any problems, and that's the major that's the major um, difference between necrosis and apoptosis. That's going to start at the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is responsible for essentially initiating cell death when there's an issue. And in certain diseases like cancer, uh, cancer can kind of bypass this. It can reprogram the cell to be like, okay, we're not going to let you do apoptosis. We only want you to, oops, sorry about that, went the wrong way. We only want you to do necrosis uh, because the cancer can metastasize easier when the cell's guard is down and the cell cannot take care of itself. The cancer can kind of take over the cell and metastasize itself and spread itself. Okay, so that's why I'm bringing this into play here. So with apoptosis, this is very organized. It's very controlled. This is considered programmed cell death. And it is a central feature of normal tissue development and turnover. So apoptosis, uh, as I said, can be, can be uh, triggered by inflammation, chronic inflammation, or if there's um, if there's inflammation, if there's inflammation or um, DNA damage. So these major players um, in this process are the caspases. Um, so. When the mitochondria wants to undergo uh, apoptosis or programmed cell death, 
Uh, it is vital that these cytochrome C and caspases are initiated because they're going to help dismantle uh, the mitochondria and other portions of the cell into really neat nicely contained packages um, and it's also going to undergo phagocytosis so so cell death results from the engagement um, of these caspases and they're going to help dismantle the mitochondria and other parts of the cell in a kind of silent demise where uh, necrosis, the mitochondria and the cell is going to be kicking and screaming because it's undergoing trauma where uh, when we have apoptosis, it's going to be silent and well organized. And this demise is basically conducted by these caspases. And they're, they're, they're a family of proteases. So what, is, what does a protease do? A protease basically basically breaks down protein. They're enzymes that help digest and break down proteins, and they're a major part of the apoptotic uh, stimuli. So um, they're going to be, they're going to cleave, they're going to digest, they're going to break down, and they're going to change the morphology of the mitochondria uh, through this through this deconstruction phase that is going to be organized. Um, and Basically, this is going to happen, as I said, in a non-inflammatory way, and they're also going to undergo phagocytosis, where things are going to be uh, digested and broken down um, in an organized way. And let me just kind of go back one more time. So we're going to see this, right? We're going to see uh, phagocytosis occur, and we're going to have debris, and uh, basically the cell will, will will perish that way. So we're going to have two types. So, and I we could go into much deeper water with this, but I just want you to know what is the takeaway uh, when we have. Um, this uh, necrotic cell death, it's going to be initiated in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is going to develop uh, these pores. We talked about two pores. Calcium is going to flood in. Um, when we have uh, one of those pores that is open for too long, which is, again, the mitochondria permeability transition pore, that's going to lead to changes in osmotic state. We're going to have water flood in. We're going to have the mitochondria begin to swell and expand. We're going to have disruption of the electron transport chain. We're going to have changes in the proton gradient. Uh, we're going to have disruptions in this chain, which then means the electrons and the oxygen are going to mix together and make free radicals. The free radicals are going to uh, bind to the inner and outer membrane and destroy the membrane. The contents from in the mitochondria is going to spill into the cytosol of the cell. And then we are going to have a inflammatory inflammatory response, and it's going to be a slow agonizing cell death um, that is not regulated, where when we have the apoptosis, we're going to have uh, not swelling, but shrinking. So the chromatins are going to shrink. Uh, the We don't have any of those pores being opened up. This is not calcium dependent. This is caspase dependent. We are going to have um, basically caspases that are going to be released and help break down the mitochondria. It's going to be done silently. We're not going to have inflammation. There's going to be phagocytosis that's going to help with this. Um, these caspases are, they're an ACE, right? So they're an enzyme. They're proteases. They're going to help kind of chew and break down and dismantle this mitochondria and get rid of it. And then uh, one of the other things that's going to happen is in apoptosis, the cell will be fine. The cell will survive because we don't have any of this content spewing into the cytoplasm, where in the necrosis, uh, the cell is going to be endangered and it's going to have, it's going to be it, basically toxins are going to be floating in, in the cytosol because the content of the content of the uh, of the mitochondria is going to now be in the cytoplasm. We're going to have all this inflammatory uh, response happening. Um, and that's the major, major differences. So please keep those differences in mind. And I'm going to have just one little quiz here for you guys. You can read this on your own and see if you can uh, see if you can respond to it after this very long lecture. That is all I have for you. I'm going to get this thing up for you guys. I am tired of talking. I will see you soon. And uh, that's it, guys. Take care.